optimal minimal. At this altitude, I can run flat out for a half mile before my hands start shaking. Can I ask you a personal question? Now what is it in a perfect time? What if I did the opposite? I'm a cybernetic organism, living tissue over a metal endoskeleton. This episode of The Tim Ferriss Show is brought to you by LinkedIn. The right hire can make a huge impact on your business. The wrong hire can crater your business. And I have seen example after example from thousands of my readers at a minimum where they've told me stories of how finding the right person at the right time, and in some cases not even asking what should I do, but asking who should I find because that person can help me determine what exactly to do more intelligently. And I've had a chance to hire two such people in the last year and that has just made my business take a quantum leap forward and my complexity in my personal and business life get cut dramatically. And this type of simplification cannot be overvalued. We think a lot about hiring and I think a lot about hiring and it is a skill that I've had to learn. It is important to find the right person. But where do you find that person? You can post a job on a job board and hope that that right person finds your job, that they are on the internet happening to scan something here and there and then find you. But think about it. How often do you hang out on job boards? The answer is probably not very often. So don't leave finding someone great to chance when you can post your job exactly where people go every day to make connections, grow in their careers, and discover job opportunities. That is LinkedIn. Most LinkedIn members haven't recently visited the top job boards, but 9 out of 10 members are open to new opportunities. And with 70% of the U.S. workforce on LinkedIn, posting there is the best way to get your job opportunity in front of more of the right people. And you can be very, very highly targeted and specific. People who are qualified for the role you have and ready for something new. This is where you find them. It's the best way to find that person, that key person who will help you grow your business. And this is why a new hire is made every 10 seconds using LinkedIn. That's bonkers. Every 10 seconds. So head to linkedin.com forward slash Tim and get $50 off your first job post. That's linkedin.com forward slash Tim, T-I-M to get $50 off your first job post. LinkedIn.com forward slash Tim. Take a look. Terms and conditions do apply. This episode is brought to you by Peloton, which I've been using probably for about a year now. Peloton is a cutting edge indoor cycling bike that brings live studio classes right into your home. You can also do on-demand, which is what I do. We'll come back to that. So you don't have to worry about fitting classes into a busy schedule or making it to a studio or gym with a hectic or unpredictable commute. I, for instance, have a Peloton bike right in my master bedroom at home, and it's one of the first things I do many mornings. I wake up, I meditate for a bit, then I knock out a short 20-minute ride in my undies, hard to do that at the gym, take a shower, and I'm in higher gear for the rest of the day. It's really convenient and has become something that I look forward to. So you have a lot of options. For one, if you like, you can ride live with thousands of other riders across the country on an interactive leaderboard to keep you motivated. There are also up to 14 new classes added every day with more than 8,000 classes on demand. And you can pick based on length, 45 minutes, 20 minutes, whatever, music, hip hop, rock and roll, or say low impact versus high intensity or interval. You can pick the class structure and style that works for you. And in my case, I quite like Matt Wilpers, and I tend to do on-demand and listen to a lot of and watch many of the same classes over and over, but I'm kind of promiscuous and also enjoy classes from a lot of the other instructors. They have Peloton, an amazing roster of incredible instructors in New York City with a whole range of styles and personalities, so you can find what you're in the mood for. You also get real-time metrics that you can use to track your performance over time, and that will help I would say catalyze you to beat your personal best. Now that all sounds good, right? Gamification, yada, yada, yada. I didn't think that it would work for me or in any way incentivize me, but they really 100% hit the nail on the head. I was very, very impressed with how motivating it was. And it worked tremendously to keep me pushing, uh, which quite honestly takes a fair amount. I can get quite lazy, particularly with anything that edges on endurance, which is kind of more than five reps of anything for me. So... Check it out. 
Discover this cutting-edge indoor cycling bike that brings the studio experience right to your home. Peloton is offering listeners of this podcast a limited-time offer. Go to OnePeloton.com, that's O-N-E, Peloton, P-E-L-O-T-O-N.com, and enter the code TIM, all caps, at checkout, and get $100 off of accessories with your Peloton bike purchase. So, get a great workout at home anytime you want. Check it out. Go to OnePeloton.com and use the code TIM to get started. Why, hello, boys and girls. This is Tim Ferriss, and welcome to another episode of The Tim Ferriss Show, where it is my job each episode to deconstruct, tease out the habits and routines, best practices, life lessons, and so on from world-class performers from many, many different disciplines. My guest today is Jim Collins, and this is a rare treat because Jim very, very seldom does any media or interviews whatsoever. I have wanted to speak with him for more than a decade, in fact, and it was worth the wait. This conversation over-delivered on every level I can imagine, and I really hope you enjoy it as much as I did. So who is Jim Collins? this mysterious, reclusive, mastermind polymath. Jim Collins is a student and teacher of what makes great companies tick. And a Socratic advisor will get a better idea of what that means, particularly in the beginning of the interview where he wants to ask me questions. So we do get to Jim's story, but he wants to, and wanted to, even before we started recording, ask me a few questions. So let me get back to the bio. He is student and teacher of what makes great companies tick, and that is an understatement. He really has, has delved into the data, and a Socratic advisor to leaders in the business and social sectors. He's authored or co-authored eight books that have together sold more than 10 million copies worldwide. That's a lot of books, including Good to Great, Good to Great in the Social Sectors, Built to Last, How the Mighty Fall, Great by Choice, and his newest work, Turning the Flywheel, which gets into all sorts of details about the self-perpetuating, in some ways, models behind Amazon, Vanguard, and so on. Fascinating concept and uh, very practical examples. Driven by a relentless curiosity, which you will get front row seats for, Jim began his research and teaching career on the faculty at the Stanford Graduate School of Business, where he received the Distinguished Teaching Award in 1992. In 1995, he founded a management laboratory in Boulder, Colorado. In 2017, Forbes selected Jim as one of the 100 greatest living business minds. And uh, we talk about not just what makes good companies great, we get into that a bit, but really we're digging into Jim himself. We talk about how he tracks time, how he breaks up his day, his uh, sleep optimization, his stories related to Peter Drucker, which are just amazing, and so on and so forth. Uh, he's also, as uh, I might have already inferred, multifaceted and multi-talented. He's an avid rock climber as one example and has completed single-day ascents of El Capitan and Half Dome in Yosemite Valley. And if you don't know what that means, just take my word for it. It's very impressive. You can find more about Jim at jimcollins.com. And now, without further ado, please enjoy, and I certainly enjoyed it, please enjoy this wide-ranging conversation with none other than Jim Collins. Jim, welcome to the show. I'm really happy to be here, and uh, uh, I'm I'm hoping that you wouldn't mind if I start by exercising a bit of my own curiosity, just to to ask you some questions to begin our conversation. I would I would love to jump into it any way that you would like. So I'm I'm game for questions. So I I, I, I I'm dying to ask, what did you do your Princeton senior thesis on? My senior thesis, which took some extra time to complete was on the the phonetic and semantic acquisition of Chinese characters by native English speakers. And it was looking at language acquisition, but specifically what most people in the West would consider ideograms. And there are a few different layers of meaning or context for each character that one might acquire. So the thesis was about the different approaches, the pros and cons of various methods for acquiring these characters. And, and what is language acquisition? It's a, it's, a, it's a major I've never quite heard of, and I'd be curious what its essence is. So within the East Asian Studies department, uh, you, you had to pick 
a primary language. And I, I chose Japanese because I had spent a year in high school in Japan going to a Japanese school as an exchange student. But I ended up taking primarily Chinese classes because my, my Japanese level was already decently high. And within the context of that department, language acquisition would be focusing on and this is really good. It's a it's a very good question because the way that I look at language is really acquiring concepts and a almost an operating system for thinking that is associated with a different culture. And that would generally in say a language like Chinese and most languages start with the phonemes, the sounds themselves. And in the case of something tonal like Mandarin, you're actually going to be doing a lot of training. It's almost like going to the gym and lifting weights because to produce a sound like, mm. uh, or a word like yeshu, which is maybe, or if you wanted to ask with a retroflexive tongue, na shi shi ma shi qing, like what is that thing? You, you really need to develop musculature that you have not developed before as a native English speaker. And then after you've developed the basic, uh, the basic phonetics and pronunciation verbally, you would move into the writing. And for some scripts, and the writing tells you a lot about the thinking of a given culture. And I, I think of culture as a, a sort of a collection of shared beliefs and habits. Uh, because some are, are, are purely phonetic, like we have our Romanized alphabet, and then others have multiple layers, like Chinese, where you have a character that's composed of radicals, each of which has a particular uh, connotation in terms of uh, in terms of meaning and the the etymology. So all of that is uh, those would all comprise ingredients in the recipe that is language acquisition. And and and, and forgive me for asking you a follow up question on that. I'm just I'm curious, just as you've clearly come from both a love of language but also a study of language. Uh, how much do you think the language in which you're operating, uh, uh, whether that be mathematics or, or whether it be Japanese or Chinese or English, um, either constrains or, or enhances the concepts that we develop? I would say almost completely. I think uh, the, I can't remember if it was uh, uh, Wittgenstein or Wittgenstein, yeah. who said the, what is it, the yeah. limits of our language or the limits of our world or something to that, to, uh, to that effect. Uh, I, I really feel like language and thinking are inseparable. Uh, and therefore, part of the appeal to me in acquiring other languages, studying other languages, even if I only use them temporarily, uh, like I, I did when I visited Turkey or Greece, these places, I still study the languages very intensely because it gives you, in my experience, a different lens through which to process the world and to absorb stimuli and to react to things differently. Uh, so, so in my experience, um, you can you can you can very often tell a lot about someone by not just the language they speak, but the particular dialect within that language that they choose. So that that can apply to uh, English and the particular nuances or predilections someone has in their own, say, grammar, vernacular, even in a given family. But it can also apply to coding, and then within coding, you have different coding languages, mm -hmm. and they tend to reflect in uh, many instances different personalities and different value systems um mm -hmm. different priorities um so that's um that's mm -hmm. how i would i would think mm -hmm. about that yeah I, you mentioned wittgenstein i i am in no uh, expert on wittgenstein i had a quarter in college uh which the main focus of uh the work i was learning in was in wittgenstein and i remember the professor saying to me well what's marvelous about wittgenstein is he said something along the lines of, he lays out very clinically what we can meaningfully talk about. Uh, mm -hmm. And and then uh, the professor adds, and of course, then there's the great punchline, which is that 
most of what's really important we can't talk about. So <laughs> because <laughs> because the words can't go to the mystical. So mm-hmm. um, uh, very very interesting. And I've often thought about this when I wrestle with concepts as I'm wrestling uh, in in my own research. You know, one of the first questions I ask people often ask me, well, so how do you how do you develop a concept or how do you decide to come at something that would allow you to say you know articulate something you're seeing through the lens of, say, the level five hierarchy or the preserve the core, stimulate progress duality or whatever. The first question I always ask myself is, what's the conceptual vessel, right? Because it, to, to get a concept, you, there's different kinds of concepts, right? You've got dialectics, uh, you've got hierarchies, you have stages, you have equations, uh, you have categories, right? And one of the first most important things to do is to say, well, if you're looking at something, what's what's the best kind of conceptual vessel? And then from there you develop the concept. And now just one thing on, on language, um, it's not really about language per se, it's about the really hard uh, world of writing. And as I uh, was looking uh, about your background, Tim, I, I noted, if I read it right, that you had crossed paths with one of our great nonfiction writers, John McPhee, is that right? Uh, that is correct. I was very, very lucky and got to uh, take a class called the Literature of Fact, which was a yeah. seminar that McPhee uh, used to teach. I don't know if he still teaches it, uh, but yeah. uh, that, that I did have a chance to spend some time with the incredible McPhee. Yeah, and and I, and I, just before we launch into our our broad conversation, I I what um, what was it like to have a class from McPhee? I mean, I. I have never met McPhee, but I've been a, a huge, almost student of how he writes. Of course, and I love the most recent uh, work, uh, I think it's called Draft Number 4, where he describes to all of us who struggle with words you know, the, the struggle of writing. But he's got those great books from years ago, A Sense of Where You Are, about Bill Bradley. And he has the, the Arch Druid book, and he has uh, The Control of Nature, which recently, with all of the uh, fires and so forth happening in California. I actually went back to read to to kind of remind myself of how McPhee was writing about these things before, and 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 he had just such a marvelous way of being able to use words uh, to really uh, uh, exercise his curiosity and see things and then put them in these marvelous forms. And uh, and I've often thought, boy, if you could like learn from him how to write. So <laughs> as a proxy for that, <laughs> what what would you you know, as those of us who write, mm-hmm. we all know how hard writing is, right? Nobody would ever say writing's fun. <clears throat> um, what uh, uh, what do you what did you take from from McPhee being able to really learn directly from him? <laughs> uh, so I, I never get tired of talking about McPhee, although I worry about uh, invoking his name in a sense because I feel like uh, I'm I'm such a shameful, uh, repetitive writer <laughs> full of all sorts of fluff compared to his tight prose. <laughs> I, his, I, his prose <laughs> is tight. <laughs> I mean, uh, he is the, he's the consummate <laughs> version of that Twain uh, line about, you know, the difference between almost the right word and the right word is the difference between a lightning bug and a lightning bolt. <laughs> right. So I, so with, with the, with the, sort of preface that I, I in no way compare myself to McPhee or claim to have had all of his magic rub off on me. Uh, the class was, uh, was absolutely, uh, this is, this is me looking for the right word, looking for the lightning and not the lightning mm-hmm. bug. It, it I, I, I don't use this expression much, but it was really paradigm shifting for me in, in many respects when it came to writing and thinking. And uh, I'll, I'll mention a few things before I directly answer your question. Number one is I've carried my notes from that class with me everywhere, mm. meaning in every place I have lived since I took the class, which would have been in probably 98 or 99. So I've been carrying these notes for 20 years now. So that should tell you about how highly mm. I value them. Uh, mm-hmm. the, the, the second is I, I remember very clearly... Uh, when we had our first round of feedback on some initial writing task that we had been assigned, maybe it was, we had three, I think it was like three to five page writing assignments each week. And we would have a seminar with all the students together. And then we would have one-on-one sessions with McPhee. And I remember the first time he handed out in class 
the redlined versions of our assignments. So mm. the, 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 the printouts with his red ink on them. And in almost every case, he, he, uh, he led into it by saying, I just want you to know before I hand these back that you are all good writers. So I don't want you to take this, take this the wrong way or something like that. And there was more red ink on the page than black ink. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and over time, he, it, was, it was remarkable how, how quickly you could hone your observation to identify superfluous words, mm -hmm. uh, to identify the fat on the sentences that you're putting on the page. And what ended up happening, I, I should say that's on the micro level, on the macro level, and we can come back to this, and I do have questions about your conceptual vessel mm -hmm. comment earlier. It was structure. It was, it was thinking about structure visually that really changed the game for me with respect mm -hmm. to all types of writing. And uh, for those people who do like to get into the weeds, I, I think that draft number four gives plenty of examples of mm -hmm. how intricately he thinks about structure. And he did a number of interviews with the Paris Review on nonfiction writing, which are also really worth reading. Uh, but my grades in every other class went up. Hmm. A and yes, it's multifactorial. There are all sorts of other things that, that could have contributed, but the, the, the correlation between starting that class and all of my other grades improving in all of my other classes uh, was uh, really uncanny. And I think that is very specifically because it was it was tightening up my thinking and it was forcing me to on a weekly basis justify the use of specific words and uh mcphee is a real stickler for the right word mm -hmm. yep. <laughs> and if you use something that is vague that seems like a a lazy backup option that you tend to default to a lot, he will spot that very, very quickly. And uh, it was a wonderful, wonderful class. And he is a very entertaining teacher as well. It's not uh, like having a, a clinical autopsy done of your work each week, although he is also very dispassionate and certainly not trying to just make you feel good with his feedback. But uh, he, he, over the years, has, has developed a very... Uh, entertaining style. I remember at one point he was uh, riffing on the various ways that one can convey he said or she said. And he, <laughs> and he brought up the very real example when people say, you know, she ejaculated. And then he just, you know, went on this riff about how unnecessary that was. And I got a good chuckle out of the students, of course, because there was a lot of heavy lifting to come 20 minutes later when we were going to actually jump into some type of task. So it's a long answer, but McPhee is, along with a handful of other people I can point to very uh, specifically, uh, one of the people who has had the biggest impact on my writing, but uh, more importantly, on my thinking and how I think about structured thought. Uh, and, and I want to say one thing about Wittgenstein really quickly before I forget, and that is many of, or I shouldn't say many, but a uh, surprising number of the people I respect for clear thinking uh, have an affinity for Wittgenstein. Uh, mm -hmm. Reid Hoffman, the co-founder of LinkedIn, would be another example of that. Uh, and I, I think that that's worth mentioning just because uh, I think philosophy... There's certain categories or labels of the uh, fields of study that sometimes get pushed to the wayside as impractical. And I, I, I think the study of language and the concepts that language represent uh, is extremely, extremely valuable. Uh, I mean, it's kind of one step above consciousness if we're looking at <laughs> like the foundational layers upon which everything else is built. Um, so let me ask a question, if I may. And, yeah, uh, please. And, 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 and thank you for letting me start with, uh, with exercising my curiosity. Uh, it, it, um, uh, it, it's it's a wonderful to have a chance to begin uh, with questions, but questions work in both directions. <laughs> oh, for sure. And I, I, I have uh, 
I have I have so many questions, but I'm, I'm going to try to no, I'm going to try to I'm going to try to prioritize them a bit. But the the conceptual vessel term that you used uh, or phrase I should say, could you give an example of choosing the right conceptual vessel? Yeah. Uh, so uh, I'll, maybe I'll use a couple, but let me start with um, with one. Uh, so back back when we were working on the research for what became. Uh, good to great, a little bit of a story of what was happening. When, when we went into uh, the good to great research and everything we do is a, is a research base to it, I had really given the research team the instruction that I didn't really want to have a leadership answer. And uh, the reason for that is because I was always skeptical, especially from the built to last research, which had come before, of placing too much emphasis on having a single leader. Number one, if you're going to build something truly enduring, it has to transcend the leader. They all go away. They all die. Uh, You can't have a system based on a single leader. Um, And the second is you can go around in a big circle where you can say, hey, uh, if that company was successful, it must have been a great leader. And then if it's not successful, you say they weren't a great leader after all. And you're just in a big circle. You're not learning. So I I said to the research team, I don't want to study. uh, I don't want to have a, a, a leadership answer. And my research team, which is usually composed of uh, somewhat, uh, I would say, highly irreverent, smart people who just work really hard, and they love to challenge me. And we had these, these what we call uh, uh, kind of research symposiums, because Curious George was our is our kind of our mascot, right, of curiosity. And we would have symposiums, and uh, (laughs) and and so we would we would we would be talking about the research. And one day, the research team uh, kind of essentially joined hands when I came in, and they and I said, "What's up?" And they said, "We're going to tell you today that you're wrong." I said, "Well, what about?" And they said, "Well, about this." anti-leadership bias that you have. Uh, Each of us, we're responsible for studying the good to great journey, the inflection of these companies that were average, that that made that leap. And and, um, uh, and we see that at that point of inflection, uh, the leader played a huge role. And to ignore that is to ignore the evidence. You always tell us, Jim, pay attention to the evidence. We invoke that here today, you're wrong. And, and I responded to the team by saying, well, let me ask you a question. You remember your high school algebra? And they all, of course, did. And said, so remember, if you have the same variable in the numerator as the denominator, uh, the variable goes away. And so uh, as, a, as a relevant differentiator. And so um, I went to the whiteboard and I put a little you know, line up there for the numerator, the denominator. And I put um, good to great companies in the numerator and comparison companies in the denominator. Now, our research method, and this all gets to the conceptual vessel, but I kind of have to sort of know how we get there. So uh, all, our research is always based uh, on a method that uh, developed with uh, a, re- a great mentor of mine. And one of the themes, by the way, I think that's going to come up in our conversation is what I see as the, tran- the incredible role that who luck, right, the luck of the right people that intersect your life place in the journey. And I had great who luck in a research mentor named Jerry Porras uh, at Stanford when we were doing Built to Last together. And Jerry pushed us to develop this method where he said, look, if you study successful companies or companies that uh, achieve certain things, but you only study the successes, well, you're going to find they all have buildings. Well, does that mean having buildings will make you, (laughs) right, a successful (laughs) company? Right. And and so he said, what we have to have is a comparison set. And we developed this this, uh, historical method where you study the entire history of two evenly matched companies at the start of the journey that are in the same place, same time, same resources, same potential. And then one breaks out to a totally different level than the other and holds it long enough that you can have confidence in it. And the other that was a virtually identical twin at that time does not. And at the birth of any industry, for example, you have an explosion of new entrants. So all the early semiconductor companies, and in there you're going to find a, a, a twin pair of companies that are virtually the same, but one of them becomes Intel and the other one doesn't, right? So why? And so I said, you always have to ask what's really different compared to what? It's a, it adds huge amounts to the work, uh, just the the magnitude of work you have to do to do the comparison because it basically more than doubles everything you do. But that's how you see. And of course, you find 
all the comparisons also have buildings. So buildings can't be the answer. So I went to the whiteboard and I said, okay, so we have the good to great companies had these remarkable people that led them through the transition. Well, let's look at the comparison companies and started ticking through the list and found, oh, sure enough, the comparison companies had some remarkable leaders and some of them were even really extraordinary leaders. I mean, Jack Eckerd, who had built Eckerd and uh, Stanley Galt at Rummerbait. I mean, these were really, really good leaders. And so I, I wrote leadership in the numerator. I wrote leadership in the denominator. And I said, guess what? The variable drops out. We have it in both. It doesn't really matter as a variable. Well, let's go back to work and do something useful. And, uh, and the team, <laughs> you know, th this is the wonderful thing about smart, irreverent young people. They, they sort of closed ranks on me and they said, we knew you would do that to us. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we came prepared. And, uh, and this is when the team, and this is the value of having a great research team, saw something that then led to this notion of, the, of what eventually became the level five idea and the conceptual vessel for it. So the team said, Jim, you're right. Both sets of companies, the good to greats and the comparisons at the critical moment in time had leaders and there's no evidence that the leaders were any less exceptional in terms of their pure leadership ability. But there's something different about the good to great leaders. They're cut from a different cloth. It's not about their personality. Many of them were shy and reserved and soft-spoken, never drew attention to themselves, right? Uh, uh, so it wasn't about that. There's something different about them. And that became interesting. And essentially what happened then was the question was, what's the difference between these leaders? It wasn't leadership because they were both leaders who did leadership. There was something different about the leaders. And so th there was the signature of their humility and then their fierce will on behalf of something that's not about them. They were able to subsume their ego into the company. And that blend of humility and will is what stood out. And that was different from the comparisons. So that was interesting. So you kind of step back and you say, okay, now how do we capture that conceptually? And I went out onto my porch and I started thinking, okay, is this just an idea? They're just humble leaders. No, that's not quite it. There's something about this duality. Is it a dialectic? Mm, didn't seem to be quite right. And I started playing around with different things. And I, I had this flash that went through my mind of it's a hierarchy. And it's a pyramid of capabilities. And you kind of climb up this hierarchy. It was sort of almost like a Maslow's hierarchy, except it was of leadership. And that there, was a, there were levels to it. And I thought, this is a hierarchy of levels. Level one would be individual capabilities. And so that would be at the base of the pyramid. And then you go from individual capabilities to level two, which is you get really good at playing well with others, right? Good team skills. And then level three, you would learn how to manage. And by the way, as an aside, never denigrate great management. Anybody who's had a poor manager knows <laughs> how awful that is to work for one and how great it is to work for a great manager. And then above level three becomes level four. And you go from managing to learning to lead. And then there was a higher level. And that higher level was the level five. And the level five, well, you, you could be a leader as a level four. To be a level five leader, you had to go to the next level of the hierarchy and add in this ambition for something's bigger than yourself with humility and with will. And that when you stand back and you looked at that, you could look at it and say the right way to convey this idea is as a hierarchy that you grow through as distinct from some other way. I had to kind of find the, 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 the way of capturing and then the critical thing is it's not leading, it's are you a five or a four? And here's sort of the overall pyramid. And just to illustrate, let me just invoke uh, 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 somebody who wrote their Princeton thesis on what became a level five journey. One of the great leaders that I've gotten to know is Wendy Kopp, the founder of sure. Teach for America, Teach right? Teach for America. Mm -hmm. Yep. She wrote her senior thesis on it, which is why I'm always curious. I mean, Jack Bogle wrote his senior thesis on mutual funds and ended up creating an amazing thing. Uh, Wendy Kopp wrote, wrote hers on, uh, <laughs> uh, on what became Teach for America. But if you look at Wendy Kopp, 
if you were to ask the question, you know, where is she on that? Well, she goes, she went through all, all the levels. And, but she's not just a leader. She has that extra dimension where she's got that genuine personal humility and an absolutely ferocious resolve for the overall cause that is not about her. And if anybody that's met Wendy or seen her, you would never think this is about Wendy Kopp. Uh, you would never think, uh, but if you ever doubted her resolve, right, you know, that image of her sitting there trying to get her first uh, 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 funding for Teach for America, where her image is, I put glue stick on the bottom of my pants and I would not leave the chair until I got a $25,000 check. I mean, just sheer will and will for ultimately the kids and what, how the kids' lives could be changed and yet genuine humility. And so she went to the top of the hierarchy. And so when I stand back, I look at it and say, that's the right conceptual vessel for this journey of what we had seen. Now, other, other concepts. May I jump in for one second? Yes, sure, please. The question was genuine humility. How do you identify genuine humility? What are the characteristics and how do you uh, separate it from false humility Mm. or what someone presents as humility. I guess I'm wondering how you... How, you how we, how we, how we uh, imputed that from the research data. Correct. Yeah, yeah, it's a great question. So, so first of all, in, in all of our work, uh, we start, not surprisingly, with uh, a question of curiosity, right? It always has to be something... I just am really curious enough to go through the years of suffering to get some insights. And then you translate that into the research method, the, the comparison method, the historical method, and so forth. And then you collect vast amounts of information. So in the good degree, and, and, and the key is you're not looking for anything in particular. You're looking for patterns of difference. Why did one set of companies, what was different about them versus the others as you walk through time? And, and or what kinds of decisions they made and so forth, always going to that difference question. And, uh, and so what we began to notice is that the, uh, the good to great leaders was fascinating that number one, you can, you can do what's called event analysis. So you can do something like say, let's call an event, the number of times in speeches you use the vertical pronoun versus you don't over the course of a career. And that's something you can count. Right, so you can look at it and say, let's take the good to great CEOs and let's take the comparison CEOs and look at every letter they wrote that we can get hold of. Let's look at every speech they ever gave, every interview they ever gave, right? I mean, you got mountains and mountains of information. Now let's go through and literally count how many times they tend to take credit themselves, how many times they give the credit to others. How many times they uh, don't use the vertical pronoun I? How many times uh, they, they do? Now, later, of course, if somebody had read level five, they could try to pretend to be level five. I'll never forget an email when somebody sent me an email that says, help. And I open it up and says, dear Jim, our CEO just walked in and announced he's level five. What do we do? <laughs> <laughs> Have them reread the chapter. So, you know, I mean, it, it, but these were people that they were just doing what they were doing. I know they weren't trying to show themselves one way or another. That's the thing of looking over course in an entire history or career. You can count things. How many times did they allow themselves to be on the cover of a magazine? How many times uh, <clears throat> when, when, uh, when they're in discussions about things that did not go well? Right. You can look at window and mirror events, things that, that did not go well. Well, one approach is when something does not go well, you can point out the window and subtly or not so subtly attribute the reason it didn't go well to factors outside yourself. Right. The economy or somebody lets you down or a partner didn't come through or whatever it happens to be, but somehow it's not you. Or there's the window approach, which is your kind of natural tendency is all that might be true. It doesn't change the fact that I'm responsible uh, and I'm on this and this is the mistake I made and so on and so forth. And you can look and again, it's comparative. What did the comparison CEOs do? You can count a lot of events of some version of pointing out the window. What did the good to great CEOs do? You can count a lot of versions of pointing in the mirror. 
And so you begin to add all this up, right? And over the course of decades, because we, we look sometimes over 50, 60 years, uh, and some CEOs were in harness for multiple decades, that then, and, and since they're all publicly traded companies, people often ask, well, why do you only study publicly traded companies? My answer is because that's where the data is, right? <laughs> it's not because, <laughs> right? Because right? that's, that's the beauty. They all have to report the same way. They all have annual reports. They all have earnings calls. They all have all these things over time that you can then use as data sets. I'm, never, I'm not really a business author. I just happen to have used companies as the method to study human systems mm -hmm. because there's great data. And, uh, and so that's where the data is. And if you do that, and we have 6,000 years of combined corporate history in the research database, pretty soon you can start counting a lot of things. And then you can begin to say, there's a substantial amount of quantitative evidence that adds up to a greater level of humility in these than those. And that's how you get there. May I ask you a question about counting? Yeah. All right. So I, we, we have a number of books we could talk about, and we are going to talk about some of them, but Built to Last has a subtitle, Successful Habits of Visionary Companies. Yep. I'm very fascinated by what might be the successful habits of Jim Collins, and this is a question about counting. Mm -hmm. In the course of doing some of the homework for this conversation, uh, I have come across different ways that you seem to measure your time mm -hmm. and your days. And I'd love to explore that for, for just a little bit. Um, sure. So the, the first was I read that you had, and this may have evolved or changed by this mm -hmm. point, but a stopwatch with three timers in your pocket. Mm -hmm. uh, can you, uh, and that it was yeah. in, in sort of indicative of creative teaching and other, uh, but, yes. but could, could you explain uh, that habit, please, for people who oh, are sure. not familiar. Well, so actually, let me tell you the story of how it began, yes, what the three were about, and then how it's evolved into something a little simpler and a little more powerful in what I do with it every single day. Perfect. So I, I don't want to pretend that I'm normal, okay? So <laughs> what I want to describe is, is not normal behavior, but this is, this is it. So when I, uh, when I was 36 years old, uh, I made the decision, and we can come back to this later if you want to talk about big bets and doing scary things, uh, such as betting our career, betting our lives, Joanne and I on an entrepreneurial path. Uh, let me just kind of step back and sort of share the origins of this. Mm -hmm. um, yep. So I was teaching at Stanford, and I, I, it was a marvelous journey, and of course I had great mentors and learned how to do my research there. That's where Jerry and I did Built to Last. But I had a, another mentor who encouraged me to think about whether I wanted to do a self-directed path or not. And I used to say to my students, because I taught entrepreneurship and small business, uh, I, I always said to my students, why don't you go do something on your own? I mean, why give over all your creative energies for somebody else's thing? I would at least challenge them to think about that. And I would say, if you're really interested in business, you don't have to go to work for IBM to be in business. You can do your own. So my students, this is the wonderful thing about great students, they hold you to account, right? They said, well, <laughs> right. what are you doing that's entrepreneurial? I, I, this doesn't look like a very entrepreneurial thing, teaching these classes and being here. And, and so I started thinking about it, and I, started, and I realized something about myself, which is I, I like betting on myself. So I had this idea, you don't have to be at IBM to be in business, why do I have to be at a university to be a professor. So I said to Joanne, I said, you know, I think I have this idea of I'd like to be a self-employed professor to endow my own chair and to grant myself tenure. So uh, Joanne, uh, who we've done these things together through life, she went on with this idea. And the idea was to try to pursue really big questions that wouldn't be constrained by things you could do in only a year. And the first big bet on that was the research in Built to Last, and it was coming out. And I said, let's just bet everything. Let's, let's go. And so we launched this huge bet, bet everything on that book. Didn't know if it would work. We were down to less than $10,000. We were actually really scared. Uh, we call it our Thelma and Louise moment. We were, uh, uh, <laughs> right? we, we were like launching off the cliff together, except we wanted to get to the other side. And, but it was, a huge, it was a huge bet, and we didn't know if it would work. But I was very clear about one thing. I did not want to have a half-life of quality in the work. And it's one of the wonderful things about working on Built to Last with Jerry back at Stanford 
No one knew who I was. No one called. No one paid any attention. So for six years of working on that research project, I could just go into the cave and work and work and work. And that kind of deep work, I mean, you have to go deep into the data, deep into the research, deep into the thinking, the long cycles of reflection. That's how you get the ideas. And that's how you do good stuff. And what I was worried that what would happen is if I went from being invisible to being visible, and that if I was fortunate enough to have a success, that I might wake up in five or six or seven years and have not gone back to the wellspring of the deep, quiet solitude of work. And, and then your second book is half as good, mm -hmm. right? And then the next book after that is only half as good again. I wanted the quality to always get better. And so I thought, well, you know, what's interesting is a professor, or a, a university is a place that really encourages that because it's sort of designed to allow you to spend your life in that tranquility. And um, so I went to uh, some faculty members who I greatly respect. Uh, and I said, uh, how do the people in the academy that you most respect in yourself spend their time? And I got a consistent answer. 50, 30, 20. 50% 50 of your time in new intellectual creative work. 30% of your time in teaching. And 20% of your time and other stuff that just has to get done. Serving on committees, you know, whatever it happens to be that you have to do. And so I thought, that sounds good. I'm just going to start doing that. So I started, as I was heading out on the, the Thelma and Louise leap, counting my hours every day. And I would count how many hours in the day were creative, new, intellectual. And that, that the goal was that it had to be above 50%. Then how many hours would be in teaching? And how many hours would be in other stuff? Like, I mean, I got somebody got to balance the QuickBooks, right? And so uh, uh, I started counting, and that's where the triple stopwatch came. I found this wonderful triple, triple stopwatch where I could constantly go back and forth, and at the end of the day, I would have the total. Later, I came to the realization that what really mattered was the first bucket, mm -hmm. uh, the creative work. And so I eventually simplified it. Uh, there's a concept in Great by Choice called the 20-mile march. And so I, I, I kind of had a 20-mile march. I just didn't know that, that concept yet. And the idea being something you just do really consistently over time that imposes a very high level of discipline that accumulates to results. And so I, I simplified it, and I just simply said, can I just simply count the number of creative hours I get every day and then hold myself to an account? So at the end of every single day, I open a spreadsheet, and that spreadsheet has three cells on a line, of, and that's for the day. The first thing is just a simple accounting of what happened that day. You know, where did my time go? What did I do? What, et cetera. Can you give – sorry to interrupt, but I that would love – this is the stuff I love. Um, the what, what might a description for the day – look like? Is it three sentences, four sentences? What, what, um, what might it, it sort, look it like? It sort of depends on, um, uh, I mean, actually the very best days don't have much in it at all. They are got up early, two hours of really great creative work, breakfast with Joanne, five hours creative work, uh, workout, nap, three hours of creative work, enjoy dinner with Joanne, bed. I mean, <laughs> 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 that's like a great day. So, uh, but other days are full of lots of other choppy things. And so what I tend to do is to try to capture a bit of what happened with sleep, uh, what happened with uh, the, the main tasks of the day, uh, if there were some really interesting conversations that happened or something that hit in those, I'll note those. They're markers so that I can always go back and I'll share with you how I use those in a minute because I actually do these correlations with all of that. Uh, and then the second cell is the number of creative hours I got that day. Now, there's no rule about how many you get in a day. Sometimes they're zero, and sometimes they, they can be nine or ten, which would be a huge number. And But then it calculates back, back over the last 365 days. And the, and the march, which 
I don't think I've missed for well over 30 years, and I hope to hit for, for a lot longer now, is every single 365-day cycle, every single one, every single day, if you calculate back the last 365 days, the total number of creative hours must exceed 1,000, no matter what. It doesn't matter if you're sick. It doesn't matter if, uh, if there's other stuff you'd like. 1,000 creative hours a year as a minimum baseline. Now, you can be above that. That's fine. But never once. There can't be a single day in any 365-day cycle, January 2 to January 2, July 22 to July 22, September 9 to September 9, doesn't matter. Always has to be above 1,000 creative hours. And you watch it, and I put it on the whiteboard here at, at the lab, the uh, three-month pace, so you take the last three months multiplied times four, the six-month pace, and then the current 365. And that is a way to kind of monitor. If I start seeing that those numbers start to go down, you know, I'll change my behavior. And sometimes I have a big buffer and sometimes I don't. And the idea is if you stay with that, eventually you're going to have work. Now, there's a third cell that I put in there that most people uh, don't know uh, as much about because people know about the hours thing somewhat. But uh, I, um, all of us have what I, you know, dark times, difficult times. All of us have good times, right? But here's an interesting thing I noticed, which is that if you're kind of going through a funk, it colors your whole life. And you tend to think your whole life is a funk because you're looking through that lens. And so I thought, well, you know, but actually I feel like my life is really pretty good. But when you're in that other place, it's not, it doesn't feel that way, right? And so what I started to do is I started creating a code which is plus two, plus one, zero, minus one, minus two. And the other thing I put in, and, and the key on all this, by the way, is you have to do it every day in real time. You can't, like five days later, look back and say, how did I feel that day? And that what this is a totally subjective, how quality was the day? How, what was it? What, a plus two was a super positive day. Like, this that's is, a this great, is emotionally speaking. Exactly. Just, just like, was it a great day? A plus two is a, just a great day. Doesn't mean it wasn't that uh, there might not have been a really difficult day. It might have been a day of a really hard rock climb. It might have been a day of really hard writing, but it felt really good, right? Uh, it might have been a day uh, of an intense conversation, but really meaningful with a friend or something, right? But it, but it, but it adds up to as a plus two. Plus one is another positive day. Zero is yeah, you know, minus one's kind of a net tone negative, and minus two is those are bad days, right? And you put it in before you go to bed. Because if you try to remember, if I were to ask you, Tim, right now, 17 days ago or even five days ago to give the score, you're going to be distorted by how you're feeling today. Oh, for sure. I mean, right. the, yeah, I mean, memory, if you ask people what they ate two days ago, they're exactly. going to be off by 40%, 50% calories for sure. Yeah, exactly. So I write it down. And now I start to have, I've got the creative hours march, which is it's kind of discipline and service of creativity. And, I, and, I, and it's relentless, right? It just stays with me constantly. It, I mean, it, you never get a break from it. You can take breaks, but you can never get a break from the thousand floor. But that other has proved to be incredibly useful for me because now what you can do is sort the spreadsheet. And you can say, over the last five years, what's going on in all the plus two days? Oh, and over the last five uh, years. That's where the descriptions come in. Yeah, exactly. And over the last five years, what's going on in the minus two days? And now as I navigate, it's kind of like the simplex method in operations research where you find optimal by never really knowing what optimal is ahead of time. You do it by a series of iterative steps of the next best step. Oh, can and, you, hold on. Can you explain that? <laughs> I'm from Long Island, so sometimes it takes me a minute. <laughs> can, you, can you explain what that was one more time? Yeah, sure. So uh, when I, uh, my, my undergraduate was a thing called mathematical sciences uh, with a heavy dose of philosophy. And math sciences was uh, pure mathematics, computer science, uh, statistics, and operations research. And in operations research, there's a method uh, developed by a guy named George Danzig, uh, called the simplex method. And essentially the idea is that if you're really trying to find the optimal answer to a multivariate problem where there's lots and lots of variables, 
even the biggest computers couldn't basically do a giant spreadsheet and sort. There's just too many permutations. And what he showed was under certain conditions, all you have to do is find the local optimum, like what's the best next step, right? and then you reset, and then what's the next best step. And that he showed that under certain conditions, that is mathematically guaranteed to navigate you to the optimal endpoint. And that was the simplex method. As I understand them, it was 30, 40 years ago when I was in the class. But So I've always had that idea in mind. So you kind of navigate step by step. And so I think about it as in navigating life, I want more of the things that create the plus twos and less of the things that create the minus twos. But the difference that's helped me is I know what they are. Yeah. And, and I can start. It's, you know, it's not that life is never perfect, but you can do a simple more of this, less of that, then more of this, less of that. If what that are, makes any sense. It makes perfect sense. What are some of the, the patterns that you found for, for either the do more column or the do less column mm. for yourself? Yeah. So, so when I look at those patterns, uh, I would say on the plus twos, there are, um, almost two contradictory components and not contradictory, but they're just really different flavors. One is the solitude of really hard work. And sometimes one of my favorite days will be I get up, I never leave the house. uh, And I basically get to just lose myself in the research or in the writing uh, or in the making sense of things. It's a very incredible simplicity of the day. As, I, as, I've, as I, I'm 61 now, and I think about you know, what comes next, and I, in, I intend to keep creating. I want to stay in some version of that march for a really long time. My, my role models have all done that. But I think about life as having three uh, Three things, at least, I think are really important. And one of them is increasing simplicity, just sheer simplicity. Two is time and flow state. And flow state's not easy. And the third is time with people I love. And, uh, and, and so when I look at the, um, at those plus twos, they have a lot, a lot of the days would be days of high simplicity. Not much happened. There were very few moving parts. But a lot of deep, hard work and flow state, I might have been writing or doing a concept or, or creating something or, I mean, just you're lost in the work. Or rock climbing, probably. Or rock climbing. Exactly, exactly. It's arduous, but you're lost in it. Those are great. The other, though, for me is the time with people I love. And the other dimension, while I wouldn't describe myself as a highly social type person, I love the solitude of the hard work. The other side is... Um, there are the people in my life, and there are many, I have great friends, really great, great friends that many decade friends, friends back to third grade, seventh grade, all my college roommates. I mean, my personal band of brothers. I mean, I have friends and, um, and, and my wife, we've been married 38 years, uh, got four engaged four days after our first date. What? Um, four days that, after your first date? Yes, that's true. And, wow. And, okay. Um, we, we might come back to that. <laughs> we might. But, uh, but, the, but the thing is, when you have those days where you're really present and engaged with people you really love, those are plus two days. They, you may not have accomplished anything, or in the case of climbing, it might be that I went out climbing with one of my best friends, and I don't even necessarily remember the climb. It was with a friend. Mm. And so my plus two days... Uh, are either very solitude or very connected, but connected to people that have these long, enduring, really, really wonderful relationships in life. And those make plus twos. I love it. You, you at some point in life, need to meet my friend Josh Waitzkin, who uh, you and he have very similar heuristics. Uh, he was the basis for the book and the movie Searching for Bobby Fischer. So his first Ooh. life was in chess, but I, I, I won't, I won't take us too far off track, but at some point, uh, I think you guys would really, really get along. Uh, 
Okay, let me dive into a couple of clarifying yes. questions, if I may, because this sure. is this is this is so juicy. I can't, I can't, I, I don't want to just move on to the next thing. We're gonna have all these people now creating spreadsheets. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say, if this writing thing doesn't work out for you, you you should create. <laughs> you have you have a spreadsheet company. You have a journaling company available to you. Uh, creative. So this is a word that means different things to different people. What are the main activities? Or what are some of the activities that are squarely in the the creative bucket for you? And the reason I'm asking is I'm thinking of how I spend my own time. And and you have a team. I I suspect a much smaller team. But for instance, if you are working on a book that requires interviews, would spending time scheduling those interviews count as creative? or, Mm. uh, Or is there a cutoff? even if it's in service of a larger creative project where you have admin and then you have creative. So for you, what counts towards the hours marked creative? So, um, so you've hit upon exactly where the gray zone is on this. And in general, in order to, again, I have to go back to what's the overall objective. The overall objective is that uh, over time, uh, there's quality work. And so I can't start calling things creative that in the end wouldn't lead to some kind of creative output. And by the way, sometimes that creative output ends up in a drawer because it it just doesn't make it to the world. But you have to just keep working. And uh, I think of it as like being an artist in a studio. And so, well, are getting the paintbrushes ready to paint part of the creative? I would say yes. I would say that organizing the tools and, and, and maybe even ordering paint, right? Because it's in direct service to the creation of what ultimately might be in a canvas, whether the world sees it or not. I define creative as any activity uh, that has a reasonably direct link to the creation of something that is new and potentially replicable or durable. Oh, I like that. Yeah, please expand on that. So, um, so, for example, uh, if, if we have uh, in this conversation, right, I, I, I mean, there's already elements that will count as somewhat creative because just even you start thinking about uh, if, if an idea pops into my head uh, and then that leads to supporting some other, uh, you know, concept or piece of work that I'm working on. Because a lot of times, I'm sure you find this too, is there's a seed of an insight that's lurking in the back of your brain. And then in the process of conversation or in the process of trying to articulate something or in some other mechanism, it gets jarred out of your brain. And then all of a sudden you see it bounce on the table and then you go, oh, I need to put that in a bag and not forget it. Right. And, and, <laughs> right. and, right? and so and sometimes that happens. I'll, I'll give you an example of how something that you know, that that can uh, turns out to be a kind of a creative moment. I wasn't anticipating as a creative moment. I was meeting with a I, don't, I can't say who it is, but it was a very towering, uh, super charismatic, super genius uh, founder who is uh, you know, sort of to, to his world the way, say, Walt Disney might have been to his world. I mean, just you know, truly a, 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 a once in a generation. But unlike Disney, uh, this person never really started thinking about the systems that would allow him to build a company that could really ultimately go beyond uh, beyond him. And there were challenges with that. And so we were talking, I was trying to figure out, how do I, how do I get through to this? And there were, there were other people on the team who didn't really want to step up into certain roles and a whole bunch of other stuff. And so they could kind of picture that as I'm challenging, I'm trying to teach them, set the stage for making a built-to-last company. And and um, so you could view that as, well, what's creative in that? You're just kind of wrestling with this, with these people. And all of a sudden, in the middle of the conversation, I remember I, I, just, I just turned and I, I looked at him. I said, here's the problem. You, sir, are a genius. So let's just start there as the problem. You are a genius. <laughs> <laughs> and, and what you have is a thousand helpers. Now, so long as you're still a genius, and so long as all these helpers want to help you, being a genius with a thousand helpers, that's going to work really well until either A, someday you're not a genius, or B, you're gone, in which case this company just hollows out. There's nothing left. There is no company. All this is is a genius with a thousand helpers 
in a sort of a vessel called a company. It's nothing more. Well, right then, that was when this thing came out of my head, bounced on the table. I had never used that phrase before. And I immediately, I made a note on my notepad, and I went back, and if you look into the great, there's a section when I'm trying to describe the comparison CEOs in contrast to the good to great CEOs where I talk about the genius with a thousand helpers. And I contrast how the level five leaders come at it as that's the last thing they'd want to be, right? And how they'd want to build a culture and a company and ultimately be the architect of a great system versus being the genius with a thousand helpers. And there's a flow chart in there that sort of describes the difference. There. That came out of that conversation. So I got to count that conversation as creative, even though when I went into it, I didn't know that that would happen. So I wouldn't have counted it normally. There's other times where, sure, I was doing some research on K-12 education uh, recently and uh, the process of really deciding who I wanted to interview, that would count. That's like assembling the paintbrushes. If, it, if I'm balancing the QuickBooks account because I have to do that and, you know, or I'm, um, I don't know, there, there are things that just sort of clearly fall outside of it and I don't count it. I try to be a hard counter so that I stay on the march. This is super helpful. And uh, it also made me think about how if someone were to, and, and I was thinking about this earlier as well, how the 50% creative, 30% teaching, 20% other, in, in, in some respects have a... Uh, well, we will get to this. Maybe, yeah. maybe it's not. Go ahead. Maybe, no, time, I wasn't going to say. Maybe it's maybe it's not um, a flywheel exactly. But the yeah. but the 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 creativity can lead into teaching. The teaching mm -hmm. then can lead back into the creativity because it forces you, in some respects, or at least catalyzes you to express things yep. in ways uh, that that you might not otherwise, and also points out things that are unclearly formed if you then try to convey them to somebody else. Uh, and in fact, it's interesting mm -hmm. in preparing for today, and I, I love to prepare for a conversation by thinking through what we might chat about, but then it's not a script. It's like, a, it's like, a, it's like having a, you know, different plays you can have in a football game, like what might happen in the game, and then that's a conversation. Even when if I get together with a, a really good friend, I usually will write down three things I'd love to chat about today. We may or may not get to them. But one of the things I did for today was I thought, I wonder if Tim will ask me, what's my own flywheel? And, and so I actually took a cut at writing it down. If we come back to that later, I'd be happy to. Yeah, we will. We, we will absolutely come back to that. Uh, and uh, I, I, I have a path there. <laughs> yep. So you mentioned a while back, actually before, I just have to check this box or it's going to bug me. Yep. Uh, sleep tracking. So you mentioned yes. sleep. How yep. do you note or modify or have you modified your sleep? What, what, the, mm. the, can you talk to us about... Uh, I think most people would agree it's important, but how, how have you monitored and, and modified your sleep? Well, again, so I'm not normal, okay? <laughs> <laughs> and, That's and, precisely I mean, why I'm asking you these questions. <laughs> no, but, I, but, but one of the things that struck me a number of years ago uh, is that we spend so much time thinking about time management and I'm not really a, I mean, even though I describe this counting and stuff, I'm not really a time management sort of person. I'm a, like, I don't, I don't have kind of, uh, I have to organize my time a certain way or whatever. That thousand creative hours, as long as I stay there, there's millions of ways I can get there, right? So I'm, it's, it's, like, a, it's like a constraint within which now I can have a ton of freedom, right? So I'm not overly regimented. I'm just disciplined and there's a big difference. And I, uh, until when I was, I was thinking, well, wait a minute, if a third of our lives approximately are spent related to sleep, why don't we put as much thought into time management of sleep as we do into the rest of our day? I mean, it, it, it's just ignoring a huge piece of it. So one of the things I did was without, to my knowledge, having a sleep issue, I, and my, I, my insurance wouldn't pay for this or anything, I just was curious. There's a sleep center at, I think it's the National Jewish Hospital here in, uh, in Denver. They have a sleep lab where they'll do sleep tests and stuff. And I just said, hey, can I come and get sleep tested? 
And so I went down there and just scheduled myself in and spent the night and had them put the electrodes on. And I kind of feel like I'm my own rat in life, my own lab rat, where I'm always studying myself somehow, right? And and this, I used to have a little book called The Bug Book, where I'm the bug and I'm studying the bug called Jim. That's how I figured out where I was going to go in life. And so anyway, so I went down to the sleep lab and, and I said, I'm going to study, to study sleep is too strong of a word. I'm going to be a student of the science of sleep. And so, because it's a third of my life, I, why don't I understand it? So I, I got the sleep test, and I found out I didn't have any you know, serious sleep pathologies. I learned about the different aspects of sleep. And what the big takeaway I got about sleep was we tend to think of this idea of you know, seven hours a day or eight hours a day. And what I learned from this little journey, and I'm again, I want to underscore, it's not like I'm a sleep expert or anything, or I'm just trying to figure it out for myself is it's actually the number of hours that you get over, say, a 10-day cycle. So if you go up and you, you do a big climb, like when uh, Tommy and I did um, our climb on El Cap together and do it in, in a day, that means 24 hours. You're going to be awake for 36 hours. And so if you're basically like, oh, I couldn't do it without sleep, well, you're never going to do it. You can perform at really high levels with zero sleep over a day. You wouldn't want to do it over 10 days, though. And so the, the, what, what I, I started thinking was what really matters is the qu- amount of quality sleep I get over, say, a 10-day cycle. So early on, after all this, I actually started counting, and I would count naps, and I would count to just try to keep, again, very much like the 20-mile march of the creative hours, as long as I was staying above 70 over a 10-day cycle. However I got there, that was fine. Uh, I've since found that um, uh, what really... I, I'm, I, I probably still hit that number, but having counted it for about a decade meant that I ingrained the patterns of how to come at it. And what I've learned is, I guess, three, two or three things specifically about, about the sleep process for me. This is just personal. One, the 20-minute rule. If you wake up in the middle of the night and you check the time, first of all, it's also, by the way, fun to see if you can guess what time it is, right? Uh, but then check the time. And then, um, and then if you're not back asleep in 20 minutes, get up and go. And then I love, I'll sometimes go lose myself and again, back to the simple work, whatever, there's something really quiet to get up at three or four in the morning and just, you're just there with the creative stuff you're doing. That's a great time. Uh, sometimes you wake up at three, sometimes you wake up at seven. The second is for me, I'm really, really lucky. I have the genetic ability to nap in any situation. I took a nap. I woke up eight minutes before our conversation today. <laughs> I'm serious. Yeah, I'm, I know you are. And, uh, and, and, I, and, and so for me, my, my little secret uh, extra capability that I just was born with was I can nap pretty much anywhere under any conditions and I can dream. You give me 12 minutes, I'll dream. If you give me tw- 55 minutes, I'll dream. And I can wake up and boom, be fine. It's just genetic. But naps are my sort of saving. Like They, they give me this sense of like, ah, oh, whatever happens, I'll be fine because I can always close my eyes. When, I, 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 when I can nap, nap sitting up. When, when, when do you choose to nap? Well, I have two favorite times of napping. Uh, three favorite times of napping. Uh, one is uh, airplanes are great for napping. So uh, you never, I never eat anything on a plane or, you know, do any of that. I, I, I'm either trying to do something creative or sleep. And I have, I, I really, I have a sleeping kit, uh, which includes this Bose noise canceling headphones and, uh, eye covers and a donut pillow that the headphone can go in so that, you know, it's actually like really like kind of creating a micro environment so you can sleep on an airplane or wherever you happen to be. Uh, the second place, if I'm not traveling, which I try not to do too much anymore, uh, afternoons are great for a nap because you have a really good morning and then you just, and then you get a, that wonderful afternoon glow of, of creative time. Sometimes if you took a nap from say two to three or three to four, and then you have that marvelous like four to seven in the evening and it somehow coincides with the end of the day, that can be, a, it's like a second morning. And my, but my favorite absolute sleeping pattern is, uh, oh, so when Joanne's doing one of her bike rides across the country and she's gone for six or seven weeks doing it, I'll fall into a pattern where on a lot of days I'll go to bed at 11 and get up at three. I'll roll out of bed and then I'll, I'll do 
the creative work stuff, usually creative or preparing teaching from, say, three till seven. You don't eat anything. You don't drink anything. You don't have a cup of coffee. You just go roll right in. And then you go back to sleep from seven or eight until 10 or 11. And if you've ever been under general anesthetic, that second sleep is like general anesthetic. <laughs> I mean, you blink and, it, and it's just that, that deep, dark bang and all of a sudden three hours are gone. And then I get a second morning because mornings are the best. I get a second morning when I get up and then you have breakfast and then you get this really great energetic day. That for me is a perfect sleep day. Wow. I, I have these things I'm dying to get to, but then you keep bringing up interesting things, which I've, <laughs> well, go I, ahead. I, go with I, no, no, I squarely to, blame I, you for that, but I'm glad you're doing it. The bug book. Yes. You, you mentioned it in passing. What, <laughs> yeah. What is the bug book? Could you please elaborate yeah. on the bug book? On the bug book. <laughs> so, uh, when I, uh, I think a, a lot of us, and I, I certainly was one of them have a, kind of the, we struggle in our 20s to get clarity about how to deploy ourselves in, in the world. And because everything up until you kind of finish, you know, high school or college or graduate school or whatever, it's kind of structured. You don't really have to think about it. It's like, oh, I got to, I got to figure out how to do these math problems or whatever. And, but life isn't really like that. And then all of a sudden you hit, hit life and life is much more ambiguous. And so you're trying to navigate through it. So I, I, I like a lot of people was, was <clears throat> trying to, you know, figure out how best to deploy myself in my twenties. And I had multiple things that helped me do that. But, um, uh, one of them, let me just introduce a concept. Okay. And then I'll tie it into the bug book. Cause this is how I challenge young people to think about it. There's a concept in Good to Great called the hedgehog concept. And the idea of the hedgehog concept is, is to sort of simplify down. We found it by studying companies. We found that when they really focus on one or a few really big things and made very disciplined decisions over time, those would accumulate and begin to build some real results and eventually what would become the flywheel effect, which we'll chat about a little bit later. And the hedgehog concept is the intersection of three circles. And for, for a company, it's doing what you're deeply passionate about, because if you're not passionate about it, you can't endure long enough to really, really do something exceptional. Two, uh, it, it's made, the second circle is what you can be the best in the world at. And if you can't be the best in the world at it, leave it to others. So, for example... It doesn't mean being big, right? You could have a truly great local restaurant. It's never going to be big, but it's the absolute best in the world at a particular thing that it does in its specific community, right? That, and uh, no large company could come in and be better than them at that, right? That's very hedgehog, even though it's not big. And then the third is that you have an economic engine and you know how it works. And so if you have the intersection of those three, our energy it's going to go into things that we're passionate about and we can be the best in the world at and the driver economic engine you're in your hedgehog now there's a personal analogy to the hedgehog and this gets back to the bug book i'm not a big believer in sort of thinking of traditional careers i'm a big believer in thinking of finding your hedgehog and then really building flywheel momentum with that over time and so as a, the personal version of the hedgehog is, again, doing circle one, what you're passionate about and love to do. The kinds of stuff that when you do it, you say, I sure hope I get a long life because I really love doing this. The second circle isn't best in the world because if you said, well, if I can't be the best orthopedic surgeon, I won't do it. Well, then we'd only have one, right? That's not good, right? So, <laughs> so, so it's what you are encoded for. And what you are encoded for is different than what you're good at. So when I went to, to college, um, I thought I was going to be a mathematician because I was one of those kids that was good at math. And that's why I majored in math sciences. But then I met at Stanford the people who are genetically encoded for math. There were not me. I was good at math. They were encoded for math. 
It's like being an athlete where you thought you were a good athlete till you met the incredible natural gifted athlete and you realize I could never see to spin to the basket like he did. Or I could never see to put the ball there running down the field playing soccer the way she did. I just wouldn't have seen it. There's a gift. That's the encoding. And so you have to find what you're encoded for as distinct from just what you're good at. And then the third is you have an economic engine. And you can therefore, and you can fund your goals, your objectives, the things you're trying to get done. And when you have all three of those, I'm passionate about it, I'm encoded for it, and I have an economic engine in it, now you're in your hedgehog. Now, when you're in your 20s, there's all these sort of paint-by-numbers kits approach to life, right? You can be a professor, you can be a businessman, you can be a lawyer, you can be whatever, right? And the nice thing about a paint-by-numbers kit is you actually don't have to think about it that much. Because as long as you stay in the lines and you, and you paint, you're going to end up with a nice picture at the end. But the only way to paint a masterpiece is to start with a blank canvas. And, and that is sort of figuring out those three circles and then making your own unique series of decisions consistent with the hedgehog of those three circles. And they may or may not fall into a traditional bucket. And so I was trying to find my way. And I started this little book, and it was inspired by a mentor named Rochelle Myers, who um, suggested that what I do is I study myself like a bug. And imagine with dispassionate objectivity as you're going through life, you're making notes where you're observing the bug called Jim. But very scientifically, clinically. And so I remember... I was, uh, I was working uh, at HP for a couple of years out of graduate school. Great, great company at the time, for sure. But I wasn't really constructed to be in a large company. But I was trying to navigate my way. And one day, I had to give a presentation on how network computers work. And this was back in the 1980s, when it was early on in that. And I had to figure out how to communicate to everyone really the essence in our, in our team of how network computing was going to work and how it fit together. And I had to sort of conceptualize it. And then I had to teach it and, and show that all of a sudden I had this day where it's like, wow, that was really fun to figure it out, to figure out how to conceptualize it, to figure out how to put it in concepts everybody could understand, to share it with everyone, to teaching it. My bug book, when I'm then writing The Bug Gym, really loves making sense of something difficult breaking it down into understandable pieces, and teaching it to others. It was an observation in the journal. The other thing is, might be something like, the bug gym would really uh, languish if he had to spend a lot of time in senseless meetings. This is not good. <laughs> right? And so I would, I, and, and constantly observing, and then eventually that allowed me to, to that was that sort of, observation, clinical, that allowed me to eventually sort of head back to teaching at Stanford when I was 30, which then became really the start of the, 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 the real journey of what happened. With the bug book, did you write things in the bug book each evening? Did you do it, keep it in your back pocket, and when there was a uh, out, uh, like an outlying impactful or emotionally notable event you'd write in it? What was the structure I, to how you used it, if there was any? At that time, and I'm, I'm more now just kind of in the coding we described earlier, because I'm, I'm one of those really lucky people that I found this Earth stuff early, and I remember the moment I hit the classroom at Stanford, first teaching the small business and entrepreneurship class, I just knew I'm home. I'm in the three circles. Like this is, I know, is going to guide in some version, some permutation of this, probably for the rest of my life. And I just knew it. But until then, I had to kind of get to where I could see that. And so for those years, uh, I would say, if I bet if I went back and looked at them, and I haven't done that, they're in my basement. Uh, I'll bet you that probably five out of seven days, there's reasonably thorough entries in there. Hmm. And, uh, and, and those entries would also be things like noting, uh, sort of projecting out. And a lot of it was often what I would describe as pattern recognition, where you'd no be noting things, but I would also always be scanning for people that I could see them, older people much older than me. And I could, and, and the question is, I could somehow 
picture that some version of what they do somehow resonated. And I would note that. What was it about it that resonated? Why did I look up to that person? I'd spend a lot of it, not just on my own experiences, but also very much on people that I admired. Very, not people from afar, people I, I knew and observed. Not for their achievements, but something about the quality of what they were. And that was also a big part of that, that observation process. Oh, okay, this is the perfect layup segue, so thank you for what you just said, to a follow-on to you mentioning that you're 61 years old. Yep. And uh, I read in a piece in the Irish Times, you can feel free to fact check this, but you, you were quoted as saying, you know, the big years are 60 to 90 to me. Yep. I want to dwarf what happened before this with what comes next. And in between, that quote was broken up into two pieces. It says, he adds, pointing out that when he first met Peter Drucker, then aged 86, the Vienna-born sage still had 10 books left in him. So what McPhee is to you, in a way, wanting to know what it was like to study under him, mm -hmm. uh, Peter Drucker is to me. Yep. So I have a mm -hmm. copy of The Effective Executive. I've read it more times than I can count. I'm fascinated by this man, but I've never actually spoken to anyone mm -hmm. who has spent any time with him. Can you, mm -hmm. could you, would you mind just explaining who, mm -hmm. uh, who he is, for people who don't know, and then just talking about your, your history with Drucker? Mm. Well, first of all, in the effective executive, I, I was uh, very honored to have the opportunity to uh, write the forward to the 50th anniversary edition. Oh, no the, kidding. Yep, yep. And I'd, um, uh, you might want to look it up because I, I stood back and I said, I essentially said, I'm going to distill, you know, 10 things I learned from Peter Drucker uh, in that forward, some of which tie into the effective executive, but some were sort of broader than that. And it was very interesting to sit down and sort of think about some of those, some of those things I learned from Peter. So you know, I just sort of intersect a little bit with, with Peter. And you know, Peter was, um, uh, boy, so let's talk about who luck, okay, as yes. an intro to that. I have been so who lucky and and it didn't start that way because I uh, didn't really have a great relationship with my dad and and, and I um, and he died young and you know and so I kind of decided I would sort of create my own father by reading biographies and 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 people that I would really look up to and I formed a personal board of directors came up with that idea in the 1980s and started putting people on it. And so I would, and they were often people who I just admired for their character, right, more than their accomplishments. And, and I would let them kind of, kind of shape me. Um, and I hope a little bit later, we might have a chance to talk about one really amazing person in that a fellow named Bill Lazier, one of my, my mentors I, I learned from. But Peter uh, was a person who I just, if, if somebody said to me, well, somebody did say to me, so a fellow named Tom Brown, from Industry Week magazine way, way back when, but we, I don't even think we'd published Built to Last yet. Uh, we did an interview with me and Jerry at Stanford, and, and he said, well, who, who's most of a role model for you that you would most look up to? And I said, Peter Drucker. He said, why? And I said, well, because he really asked big questions. And, and so Tom, unbeknownst to me, I had previously interviewed Peter for something, and he calls uh, up Peter, and he says, there's this guy, uh, he's, maybe he's going to take his own path, uh, he really admires you, he's 35 years old, he's up there teaching at Stanford, would you be willing to, to spend some time with him? So out of the blue, I get this voicemail. <laughs> oh <my> okay. God. <laughs> <laughs> I get this voicemail, and I... I, I, I hesitate to try to mimic the Austrian accent because I, I'll, it just sounds terrible. But it's something along the lines of, this is Peter Drucker, right? It's coming <laughs> through my voicemail. And, and he says, would you please give me a call? I would love for you to meet with me. Okay. <laughs> so he's almost exactly 50 years older than me at this point. I'm, I'm heading to 36. He's, he's heading to 86. And I, I call him back from the Seattle airport. And, uh, and I call him up and, and I said, Mr. Drucker, the, 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 this is Jim Collins. And, and he's, he yells into the phone, speak up. I'm not young anymore. 
And so I'm yelling into the phone. Right? And so we arranged this day, and I think it was December 10, 1994, if I recall correctly. And I get on a plane and I go down to Claremont. Uh, and by the way, this is just as let me just pause here for something for anybody, you know, you, anyone that's listening. If somebody is willing to give you mentor time like that, <clears throat> you, owe, you owe it to them and to you to go prepared and then to do a lot of writing after. So I put uh, an entire couple, three days into preparing for being able to meet with Peter. And then when I came home, I still, I still probably have, I'm sure, my notes. I mean, I sat down and, just, and I just processed and wrote and wrote and wrote everything I gleaned from that meeting. And there were others, you know, interactions later, but, but that meeting and that, that notion of you, you owe them the respect of going prepared. It's not like, hey, I want to hang out. Let's network. It's not like that, right? You need to go. <laughs> yeah. and, then, and then really, and then you need to process and then you need to make good on it. And uh, I last year went, I had the great privilege of being able to spend a day with Jack Bogle. Uh, and that's an interesting story how that came about. But I spent like two weeks preparing and then probably three days codifying all my notes after of what you learned from this great man who only had, it turned out, one year left to live. And, and so if you, if you get that, I mean, you, you need to do it because that's how you get the return on the hulak and it's also how you honor them. Right? You're not taking their time. You have to make good on what the time they spend with you. So I went down there, and I knocked on the door. He lived in this modest house. He got a picture. It's this modest house in Claremont, and, and there's a little bit of paint needed on the door, and I knock on the door, and nothing happens. And then finally he sort of you know, wants, me to be, wants to be patient. He's kind of curmudgeonly, and the door flings open, and there's Peter. And he grabs my hand in two of his he says, I'm so very pleased to meet you. Please come inside. And we went and we sat. And I, and I have this still this image of myself of, you know, this is the model I still have in my mind of the next 30 years in many ways is to, to pattern after that way he had some sense of grace, but also the simplicity. He sat in a wicker chair. And... Uh, a few years ago, they had the when they turned his house into a museum, they had the first ever wicker chair lecture where you get to sit in Peter's wicker chair and give a lecture. And I got to give the inaugural wicker chair lecture. That's amazing. Which was, it was one, well, and the chair felt really big, by the way. <laughs> it's, it was Peter's chair. And, uh, and so he was asking, why do you want to do this work? Why do you want to pursue these questions? What, you know, and, and, and I kept trying to ask him questions, but he kept asking me questions. And then finally we got to go to lunch. And uh, I got a chance to start asking questions. And, and, um, and I asked him at that lunch, uh, which of his 26 books he was most proud of? The next one. <laughs> he did write 10 more. He was 86. And years later, um, when I, again, a great privilege, had the chance to keynote the Drucker um, Centennial. He died at 92. And Claremont asked me to come and give a keynote talk at his um, inaugural, I mean, at his centennial of his birth. And, uh, he was born in 1909. Uh, and it's actually, I think this this is on, uh, on YouTube. They put it up on YouTube. Um, the... I went, I said, I want to go see the shelf. And, and, and the shelf was all of Peter's books put out chronologically based on when he wrote them, first editions. And I said, where on the shelf was he uh, age 65? And the answer was, when you pointed to it, one third of the way across the shelf. <laughs> oh my God, that's amazing. Isn't it? And, and, and after that, they, they were so kind, they sent me a photograph of the shelf, which is kind of long version photograph. It kind of goes all the way across. I have it above my writing desk. And I look at it, and I picture a little note that, you know, I'm not 65 yet, right? I have a picture a little note, which is, you are here, and it's about 25% of the way across. And I don't know if I'll ever be as prolific as Peter was, but I'll share with you what I think was, there's so many things that were great about Peter, but 
uh, here's what I think was really great. People think he was a management thinker, and he was. He was the greatest management thinker of all time. But as I stood back and looked at all of his work and tried to think about what he was really doing, I think he was in pursuit of a giant question. And the best way I can articulate that question is, how do you make society both more productive and more humane. If you think about it, that is one of the great social questions. How do you make our society both simultaneously more productive and more humane? And I think when you look at across the arc of his life, it was guided by a gigantic, beautiful, beautiful question. Thank you so much for that story. I, uh, I'm just envisioning you seeing him sitting in that chair and then later sitting in the chair and how surreal that must have felt. It was surreal. <laughs> yeah. And, I, and, 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 and in a way, it almost felt, no, this is Peter's chair. Although I recently have started this thing around here where what I describe is uh, you know, wicker chair meetings. I don't have a wicker chair. But I'll just sometimes meet with people, um, you know, that just uh, there's something with cross path, and it's just like, oh, we're going to sit down and have tea for a little while. I think of those as wicker chair conversations. <laughs> well, I, I could spend the next the next hour on more questions about uh, your experience with Peter experiences, I should say. But I will go read the forward because I must have an older edition. I will go find the forward with some of the lessons learned. Could you give us uh, one of the one of the things that that uh, whatever comes to mind uh, that, uh, that that you learned from Peter, if, if you wouldn't mind sharing that, and then I'll, I'll share with you two. Perfect. That, well, gosh, actually, uh, yeah, there's so many. They mean, of course, I had ten of them, but I won't do all ten. Uh, <clears throat> one is that don't make a hundred decisions when one will do. And the idea of that is that, that, that Peter believed that you tend to think that you're making a lot of different decisions. But that actually, if you kind of strip it away, you can begin to realize that, there, that uh, a whole lot of decisions that look like different decisions are really part of the same category of a decision. And that what you want to do is to then be able to say, no, I'm going to make one big decision that will be replicated many, many times because it kind of conceptually captures it. So for example, um, one uh, 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 version might be, um, so in, in, my own, in my own case, right? You get, and I, I'm sure you encounter this too, you get lots of wonderful, interesting invitations. Uh, things to go do this or to go do that or to speak at this or whatever. They're wonderful. I mean, never, never uh, being grateful for those opportunities, but you have to be very selective about what you do. And so as I was struggling with how do you decide which to do, right? When you're going to say no to most of them, they all can look like a series of individual decisions, but then actually, no, there's actually a couple of really big decisions. Is it a great teaching moment potentially? And will you learn something? Okay. That's like a meta decision. And now you can sort of strip away is I was like, actually, the question is, is it a great teaching moment possibility? Or is it not? Is very different than, should I go to Austin and do this event, right? Or should I meet with this person? Or right? Those are, they, they look individual, but they're really part of a whole. That's one. And you can think of that as, you know, the simple thing like, you know, what you wear. You could make a thousand different decisions, or you could make one big decision and wear the same thing all the time, I suppose. The, the second is um, the one that, and I've shared with, with some others, but it's so powerful. At the end of that day with Peter, I asked him how I could pay him back. And he said first, I had already paid him back because he had learned. And then he, and you got to remember, this was when we were doing the Thelma and Louise thing. We were really scared, right? <laughs> we didn't know if this was going to work. And I was launching out to try to do this self-directed path and, and, and genuinely scared. And Peter said to me, he said, uh, but I do have a request that you change your question a little bit. 
it seems to me you spend a lot of time trying, uh, worrying about if you're going to survive. Well, you will probably survive. And you spend too much time thinking about if you'll be successful. It's the wrong question. The question is how to be useful. And that was the last thing he said that day. He just got out of the car and closed the door and walked away. <laughs> that was the, the Peter Drucker mic drop. <laughs> yeah, it was. <laughs> it was. And, and, but, you know, I find that uh, I go back to that over and over and over again. We have, we have, we have many, many, many avenues that uh, we can go down. Hopefully this is not the, the first and last time that we have a chance to have a conversation like this. But uh, I want to define a term that's come up a few times already now, mm-hmm. and that is flywheel. Yep. And uh, you have a monograph, a new monograph, which is out, Turning the Flywheel, uh, subtitle monograph to accompany good to great. But let's start with the term flywheel itself. What is a flywheel? So, um, and, and, and also describe why I chose to put creative hours into this because there's lots of other things that are in the pipeline still and things that I haven't gotten out. Why flywheel extension? Uh, uh, since the flywheel chapter already exists and good to great, what, why would I then write a monograph? So, so the, uh, the idea behind the flywheel, so we were looking at, let's go back to good to great. We're looking at, the, the question was, why do some companies make the leap from good to great? And others, right, who are the same, do the comparison set, a situation at moment in time, resources, industry, customers did not, right? So it's always the difference. And when we went into it, I had this bias towards believing that a dramatic transformation would happen in a dramatic way. And, uh, and sort of thinking that there would be an aha moment, a miracle moment, a point of breakthrough. Uh, uh, you could really sort of see, you know, there's, there was this grand thing that happened. And that was sort of an assumption. I don't know if I had it so explicit, but it was kind of in my mind. And then when we started interviewing, we were very lucky because we got to interview all the key executives, many of whom are no longer with us, but that were, that were still alive, uh, that had been on those teams when they made those leaps, right? So what was it like when you were there? What was, what was happening when you were there? We, we coded all the research and so forth. And one of the questions was uh, something along the lines of how did you know you know, or what was the point of breakthrough or what was right? And repeatedly, we kept getting a response, which was, I don't get the question. Uh, that's a stupid question. There was, no, <laughs> <laughs> there was no miracle moment. There was no moment of breakthrough. I don't think it was as dramatic as it sounds. It was more of a gradual process. It was like an awakening that kind of happened in steps. Right? We just got this over and over again and began to dawn on me that the way something really dramatic appears to those looking in from the outside is different than the way it feels to those doing it on the inside. And so it's like if you're watching an egg, right, and, and nothing's happening, it just looks like an egg is just sitting there and all of a sudden it cracks open and out jumps a chicken. Well, you could have a big thing, a radical transformation of egg into chicken and visionary leader transforms egg into chicken. And, right, but what's it look like from the chicken's point of view? It's just kind of one more step after a whole bunch of stuff that's been happening inside the egg that you couldn't see until it cracks open. So we were observing that the way it looked and the way it felt were different. And the way it sort of really happened on the inside, even though you can see the inflection on the outside, the best analogy I could come up with was it was a series of good decisions, supremely well executed, taken with disciplined thought that added up one upon another over a very long period of time to produce a great result. And so uh, I had this image of pushing a giant heavy flywheel. And you start pushing it in this intelligent and consistent direction. You start pushing on the flywheel and after a lot of work, you get one giant slow creaky turn and then you don't stop. You keep pushing in the sort of the direction of those three circles we talked about earlier, what you're passionate about, what you can be best at, what drives your economic engine. So it's not random pushing. And you eventually get two turns. And then you keep pushing. 
and they eventually get four, and they start to add upon each other, and then eight, and 16, and 32, and 64, and 100, and 1,000, and then 10,000, and then 100,000, and then at some point, all that cumulative momentum, all that cumulative, sort of like this, that you can, there's a breakthrough that happens, but how did it happen? What was the one big push that made it go is a nonsense question. It would be like asking, you know, what was the one investment that made Warren Buffett Warren Buffett? Well, that's a, that doesn't make sense, right? So it's a cumulative effect. And so that, uh, and then we observed in the comparison companies that they bought into the idea of these sort of dramatic moments or radical transformations or, you know, cultural revolutions or whatever, uh, savior CEOs, anything that were trying to jump to breakthrough in sort of one big step rather than the building of the flywheel. And that was kind of a doom loop. And so we wrote this chapter called The Flywheel and the Doom Loop, which was chapter eight of Good to Great. And, and it really kind of captured, it was a really neat chapter because it just sort of, for me, turned it on its head about how it actually happens. And it came from the research, right? It was all from the research. So then um, uh, after publishing uh, Good to Great, and you know, it changed our lives, and I'm very grateful for how many people it reached, but right around the time of its publication, uh, in 2001, it was published uh, in uh, October, September, October of 2001, I was invited up to Amazon. And uh, the flywheel principle was embedded in good to great. It's a fundamental principle of how you know, great companies get built over time, once it lasts, and so forth. And I knew the principle. And I, was, and I was there with executives in Amazon, and all I did was teach, right? I, I don't I just taught them the principles in good to great and particularly the flywheel coming out of the dot com it's like don't respond to this as an event respond and build a flywheel and great students often take things and make them even better and what they did was they took the flywheel and then made it their own and what what they did was to say we're going to harness the flywheel principle that came from good to great but we're going to do it by getting clear on what is our flywheel. And so to really harness the flywheel, then you have to be able to say, okay, so but that's great. The flywheel principle is the principle. But how do you then turn that into your own flywheel? Like what is the flywheel? And then what the Amazon people did kind of in a more simplistic form, but I'll just grab it here. Essentially, they, they, they had this sort of reinforcing loop, right? You know, if you lower prices on more offerings – well, then you almost can't help but go down to the next step in the flywheel. Picture a circle going around, right, to increase customer visits. And if you increase customer visits, well, then you almost can't help but get more third-party sellers. And if you get more third-party sellers, well, then you almost can't help but expand the store and extend distribution. And if you do that, you can't help but grow revenues for fixed costs. And if you do that, you can't help but be able to lower prices on more offerings, which is going to attract more customer visits, which is going to attract third-party sellers, which is going to uh, expand the store and extend distribution. You can eventually buy Whole Foods and all the other stuff. You're going to grow revenues per fixed cost and then, boom, lower prices on more stuff, et cetera, et cetera. Now, the beauty of that was that they got very specific. And what I came to understand was the flywheel principle best comes to life when you can really capture it. But here's the key. People talk about flywheels, you know, we have a flywheel, whatever. And what I came to see is that people didn't necessarily really have a flywheel because they didn't understand something deeply important about how a fly, what a flywheel really is. A flywheel is an underlying, compelling logic of momentum. It's not a list of steps drawn as a circle called a flywheel. Rather, there's an inevitability built in. If you do A, you almost can't help but do B. And if you do B, you almost can't help but do C. And if you do C, you almost can't help but do D. And if right, and around, around, and it gets driven around because there's an underlying connection. There's a logical sequence that builds dynamic momentum because A drives B, drives C, drives D, and around back to the top of the loop. And that if you can kind of stand back and then say, we need to engage in the very hard thinking of figuring out exactly how our flywheel turns, what is our flywheel, in a way that truly has that inexorable driving momentum within it and different 
organizations will have different flywheels. Different people will have different flywheels. You have a flywheel, right? And, and then the key is you build it over a long period of time. And the power of a flywheel is that it's an underlying logic. It's, it's an underlying architecture. It's not a single business, right? It's something that can be extended. You can then extend it into uh, new things as you experiment and find new things that will drive the flywheel even further, whether it be going from military bombers to commercial jetliners in the case of Boeing, but the same underlying architecture, going from memory chips to microprocessors in the case of Intel, but the same underlying architecture. And, and so what the flywheel monograph is about is basically after I like to say to people, just because you're the one who articulated the principle, as we did in Good to Great, We've, we uncovered it, we articulated it, uh, and, and it's right. But it doesn't mean you yet fully understand it, even if you're the one to bring it forth. After 15, 17 years of really reflecting on it, I realized that my understanding of the flywheel back in Good to Great was right, but primitive. And so... This notion of really, really thinking through the specifics of a flywheel became something that I really wanted to share with people because I, I felt that people were talking about it a lot, but not really understanding it. And so that's what that's about. And uh, just just for people who may be wondering, so by by mono, when you say monograph, you know, one way to think of this would be as a a short book. It's I think forty six pages. About 40, yeah. yeah, yeah, forty to forty six pages, and in that you also talk about uh, you give other examples and walk through Vanguard, Cleveland Clinic. Uh, you did mention earlier, and I don't uh, I don't know if if this is in in the monograph as well, but possibly asking you about what your flywheel is. Well, I thought, knowing you, that you might ask, so I, in my kind of uh, drive for um, you know, being prepared, I put a little thought into that, so I'd be happy to, to chat about it. Let me just share with you one thing, though, <clears throat> about the, the different examples that are in there. They cover such a, a wide range, and we have an elementary school where a school principal uses it to create results for kids, basically, and you've got healthcare, and you've got startups, and whatever, but why a, mon a monograph? Here, this is McPhee, I, I hope, would like this idea. A piece of writing has a natural length. A symphony has a length. Gimme Shelter by the Stones has a length. You wouldn't say to Gimme, well, we should make Gimme Shelter a you know, 72 minute piece. It's the wrong length for Gimme Shelter. Mm -hmm. And writing is like music, it has an appropriate length for what the music is trying to do, to be. And what I realized back uh, in 2005 was sometimes you can have something that is a powerful extension idea or an idea. It really shouldn't be a book. It's, it's not enough to be a book. Yeah, 100% agreed. Yeah, but it shouldn't be a, um, but it shouldn't be just an article because that's ephemeral. Because if it's durable, right? so we were really struggling. We wrote this thing called Good to Great in the Social Sectors, which was another monograph. And I was like, what are we going to do with this? If we make it an article, it's too perishable and too short. And if we make it a book, it's too long. It's, and, and then I, well, do you make it a chapter in the back of Good to Great? Well, the problem with that is then all the millions of people who bought Good to Great buy, need to buy another copy of Good to Great. That, that's not right. So Joanne, my strategic brain, uh, said, well, why don't we create a monograph and publish that? And started thinking about, like, remember common sense. Think of the impact of common sense by Thomas Paine. It didn't have to be big. It was the right size. And so I thought, well, why don't we bring back the genre? Right? The, the monograph size. And so we wrote Good to Great in the social sectors. I remember printing 50,000 copies and thinking, I don't have 50,000 friends to give it to when it won't sell. And then it ended up reaching lots of people. We decided to do one on the, on the flywheel here. So... Um, my own flywheel, if you want to, to chat about that, I'd be happy to take a cut yes. at describing it. Yes, please. When you do a flywheel, you need to first ask, where's the flywheel going to start? So in the case of Amazon, it's an economic flywheel for, that ultimately brings stuff to more customers and so forth. It starts with lower prices on more stuff, right? But Cleveland Clinic, 
begins with getting the right medical professionals that can fit in their culture. <clears throat> Giro, sport designer, Intel starts with great innovative products. So the start of the flywheel is a key question. And in my case, it's curiosity fed big questions. That's where my flywheel starts. It all starts with what am I curious about? That has to be at the beginning of everything. And if I'm really curious about something, well, then I can't help but want to learn about it and do research on it. And that will throw me into the research. If I do the research right and really, really throw ourselves into it and stay on those creative hours of the research, well, then I can't help but have ideas and insights, concepts that come out of that research. And then if I have those, then I can't help but want to write them and teach them and share them. And, and that means going through the suffering of writing, right? As you know, right? And, <laughs> yeah. and, and, and to write them well and to wrap them well and to get the concepts in the right vessels. I can't help but want to do that. And if I can't help, if I do that, well, then I can't help but have at least some impact on the world if it's well done because that's the power of writing. You never know where it goes. And if you have impact and reach in the world, well, then you can't help but have funding that comes from that, meaning there's some economics that comes that allows you to do what? Fund and feed your next curiosity big questions, which then leads to the research, which then leads to the chaos to concepts, which then leads to writing and teaching, which then leads to impact on the world, which then generates funding, which then allows me to fund the next question. And then it's perpetual. Is it, is it also the case that in some cases, I'm, I'm struggling with how to, how to ask this question because it just occurred to me, but uh, I suppose it is th that... Um, is it as true that there are negative flywheels as there are positive, sort of these vicious cycles that are reinforcing within companies that people should be aware of? Or is the flywheel as you use it uh, a virtuous cycle? Uh, should people be also looking at sort of disabling uh, flywheels that they might have organizationally? So uh, the answer, it's a, it's a great question. And actually, I think it could be really interesting to think about dysfunctional flywheels, right? Uh, and really think about those. And I would I'll offer two things. Uh, the, the first is that if a flywheel doesn't seem to be working, you have to kind of get the diagnosis right. Because it could be that the flywheel is just, you haven't got the flywheel right. Or it could be that the flywheel is fine, but think about the inexorable logic. Imagine you could score each of the five or six components on how well you're doing it. Uh, say one to 10, and suppose your scores are eight, nine, 10, nine, three, nine. Well, the very nature of the flywheel, the fact that it's the reinforcing logic that builds incredible momentum over time has a downside, which is that that three stops the whole flywheel. And so you have to be able to say, well, maybe we have a flywheel that's working. It's a great flywheel, but the problem is we're not executing on this piece of the flywheel and therefore the entire flywheel stalls or stops. So that's an important thing for people to think about. You can't, if you do five, six of the flywheel well, you don't get five, six of the momentum, you get none. And that's uh, sort of the downside of the, of the flywheel because you got to execute on all of it. Now going to this other question, in good to great, and a lot of this concept came from good to great, which is why we go back to it a lot. There are all the other books built to last great by choice and so forth. But in good to great, uh, and then later we explored it further in How the Mighty Fall, which is studying how great companies fall. We described this other pattern we saw in the comparison companies or in the companies that fell, which is a doom loop. So you have the flywheel on one hand and you have the doom right. loop on the other side. And yes, and the doom loop, though, tends to have the following pattern. You are grasping for some sort of salvation, a new savior, a new program, a new strategy, a new direction, a new right, because things aren't working. And because it really doesn't have underlying flywheel logic to it, it doesn't really get any traction. There's a burst of hope and, and well, gosh, you know, maybe this will really work. And then that's false hopes dashed by events. And then that produces kind of a reaction without really understanding what really worked, which then leads to another grasp for salvation. And what happens is you drive yourself further and further down in that grasping for salvation, which is stage four 
of five stages of when great companies fall. And that eventually leads to companies really going to the bottom. So while you can have actually, because yes, again, you always have the comparisons, the, 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 the good to greats and the comparisons, the built to last and the comparisons, the comparisons often, in fact, double down on a doom loop and drive themselves into the ground. Hmm. Thank you for clarifying that. Uh, so I have just a, just a few more questions. Are you yes. okay to go for another five to ten? Sure. Uh, you may okay. want to sort of zoom out on something else of just sheer curiosity. Uh, oh, yes. That's exactly where I'm going. And, and it is, I've observed you to be in the research for this, in your writing, also in this conversation, uh, very data-driven, very methodical. Uh someone who 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 trust in the data <laughs> uh trusts in the data and there are two things that i'd love for you to put in context or explain for me which are which which at least at first glance don't seem to fit mm -hmm. uh, and it could be that i'm misperceiving who you are or it could be that i'm misperceiving how things transpire the first is well there there, there are two that, that jumped out the first is you having mentioned that you got engaged mm -hmm. four days after your first date. Yep. The, sec the second was around 35, 36, your Thelma and Louise mm -hmm. moment where you, it's, you, it's, you had less than $10,000 in the bank and you kind of threw this Hail Mary. Yep. Those both seem very out of character. Mm -hmm. uh, so is it that you looked at the downsides, decided you could survive, uh, and you ran some type of calculus? How did these two things happen, mm -hmm. given that you seem to be encoded to be very <laughs> data driven, to think through the contingencies, to test the assumptions, and so on and so forth. So I think those are related but very different situations, and I think they they one of them is consistent with one of our principles, and one of them I don't know where to put it. Uh, <laughs> uh, so uh, so one of the key principles from all of our work is the notion that life. Everything, you have to kind of, you know, great things build by disciplined people, disciplined thought, disciplined action, then building it to last. And then you multiply times return on luck, luck, L-U-C-K. And it's, and they, by the way, the evidence is very clear. The big winners are not luckier. We, we were able to establish that by, by quantifying luck and studying it. Uh, the big winners get a higher return on their luck than the comparisons, but they don't get more luck per se. Now, uh, in and I've mentioned this notion of who luck uh, all the way through our conversation and lessons from great mentors. One of the key things we've learned in our works, everything starts with people, disciplined people, but also just people. And uh, I, I don't know how you quantify certain aspects of just things about people. I mentioned earlier friends in my marriage and I just, you know, what time with people you love, meaningful work with people you love and respect. And so with Joanne, um, we found each other. We, we, had, we both came from families that they, they were clearly not built to last families. And, and we, we, met at, uh, we, we met in Boulder very briefly, but we really met at, in college at Stanford. And our first date uh, was a run. And I wasn't really a runner, but I really wanted to be around Joanne, but I couldn't. I was too shy, really, to ask her out. But so she eventually said to me, I said to her, so are you still running? And she said, yes. And I said, uh, well, uh, I'm thinking of upping my mileage, which was true because I had just thought of it and talked about it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so she said, would you like to go for a run? And I said, sure. And I went over to her dorm room, and she took me out on an eight-mile run. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you want to run? <laughs> yeah, you want to yeah. run. And it was the and anybody who knows the Stanford campus knows that if you go out sort of towards Page Mill Road, you go immediately uphill out of campus. So we went three miles uphill, and <laughs> and then sort of hit a wall. at about the three mile mark. It became very clear to her I wasn't really that much of a runner, and so we walked five of the eight. <laughs> <back>. <laughs> <laughs> and we got to know each other really well, and uh, that was my senior year and her junior year. And by Thursday, uh, we had simply decided to throw our lives in together. 
I don't know where the data comes from that. I don't know the evidence. I just had the sense, and, 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 and I think Joanne did too, of this, this incredible stroke of luck that these two people had, I just, I mean, we found each other and it was just an instinctive thing and we just did it. It was truly, and it's funny because Joanne later was the uh, the Nike athlete. She won the Ironman in 1985. Uh, she was in the original Just Do It campaign. So maybe she was already thinking, just do it, right? We're going to get married. <laughs> and so, so anyways, uh, and we got, in, we got married about six months later. And I can't say where the evidence comes on that, but it's hands down the best decision I ever made. And wow. But then the, the key is the commitment to make it work because relationships are about, I mean, you, you just, the unwavering, we will not fail at this marriage, no matter what. And you have to have some place in your life, you know, in, in good to great, I wrote in the acknowledgments one of my favorite paragraphs I've ever written. And it's at the end of the acknowledgments, and I was going to write about Joanne. And I wrote a line which is along the lines of um, success in the end for me is that my spouse uh, likes and respects me ever more as the years go by. And I hope by that measure to be as successful as she is. So I don't know where that comes from. Yeah, well, you, you said at the very beginning of this conversation, or maybe you were quoting Wittgenstein, I can't recall, but the... <laughs> The, uh, the many of the most important things sort of transcend the capabilities of language, right? And this certainly seems to fall into that category in, in some respects. Yeah. The, uh, the big bet, uh, so one of the things that we learned in Great by Choice with my co-author, Morton Hansen, another great stroke of who luck in my life, he's a tremendous... He's a genius research methodologist and uh, a great, great partner on Great by Choice. One of the things that we struggled with was the role of big bets and the role of, you know, kind of new directions and innovation and so forth. And one of the things that we found is the importance of empirical validation, which is really different than pure analysis. And it's a principle we call fire bullets, then fire cannonballs. And the idea being you have a certain amount of gunpowder. And, and you have a ship bearing down on you. And imagine you take all that gunpowder and you put it in a big cannonball and you fire at that ship and it misses and you turn and you look back and you're out of gunpowder. And now you're in real trouble. But imagine if instead what you did was you, you fired bullets uh, and you fire your first bullet and it's 30 degrees off and then you take another bit of gunpowder and you fire a second bullet and it's it, it shoots out there and you're, now you're only 10 degrees off and then you take a third bullet and you fire and you put it in, and it hits the side of the ship, ping, you know you have a calibrated line of sight. And now you take your gunpowder, whatever you have, and you put it in a cannonball and you fire it on the calibrated line of sight. And what we learned is that, and I'll, I'll tie this into the Thelma and Louise moment, because what we learned in our research is that one way you extend a flywheel is you're firing bullets, and then every once in a while you get calibration, and then you fire a big cannonball on a calibrated line of sight, which then adds a big burst of momentum into a whole new direct, uh, not necessarily new direction because the flywheel's turning, but uh, it gives you an empirically validated big bet that can give you massive momentum. And the key there is, notice though, it's empirical validation. And that empirical validation are the bullets. If we go back to the Thelma and Louise moment, there is the moment of gulp when you fire the cannonball, right? I mean, you can't just sit there and only fire bullets. There comes a point when you got to fire the cannonball. In that case, I was really scared because if the cannonball didn't hit, I didn't know what was going to happen. We were really felt out there. But there were also six or seven years of bullets that had been the research we had done the teaching in the classroom, 
and also some early response to built to last. There's no guarantees yet, but early response of people really resonating with the ideas, right? There, the, there, it wasn't like it just came out of the blue. There were bullet, bullet, bullet. There was enough calibration that this was not crazy. The question was, would we have the guts at that moment then to take all of our gunpowder, put it into one big cannonball and go? And there's a critical lesson I got from one of my uh, mentors, another stroke of Hulak at Stanford, and two great professors that were there with me when I was teaching, Bill Lazier, who taught me about the importance of relationships first in life. And there was this guy named Irv Grosbeck. And I asked Irv, do you think I should keep enough capital alive here at Stanford that if this doesn't work out, I could come back? And Irv said to me, an option to come back has negative value. <laughs> and I said, I thought options always have positive value. He said, no, not on a creative path. Oh, that's a really, that's such an important point. Yeah. Exactly. And he said, if you have the option to come back, it will change your behavior. And you're doing a low odds game, which means you, you have to put all in 100% full cannonball, go uh -huh. off that cliff. Otherwise, you're going to hold something in reserve. And when it gets really scary, you're going to pull back. Option is not in your interest. So we took all the gunpowder and fired it out and there was no retreat. And then when you're making the decisions, you're out there like, how are we going to get the car to the other side? And the, then the Thelma and Louise jump. Well, there's no tether back. You have to make it. And the good news is you've done a hell of a lot of calibration over six to seven years. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Just, yeah. just to underscore for people out there like, I'm quitting my job yeah, yeah. this moment. It's like, well, wait, hold on. Correct. Uh, there it was there a is a burning the ships aspect to it, but it was very calibrated. Very calibrated. I, I don't know about the four days, but the rest was calibrated. <laughs> well, that was calibrated, just perhaps not with your prefrontal cortex as much. Right. Uh, there's a lot, lot. Uh, well, anyway, we, we could talk about we could we could talk about dive into that a, another time. But I mean, there's. Uh, thinking fast, thinking slow. There's, there's, there's a lot to decision-making only part of which is, is, uh, part of which we're able to express with, with language, but what a story, uh, Jim, this has been uh, so much fun. I highly encourage people to read uh, all of your work, but uh, the newest, and I, I think this is a very, very, well, I don't think, I mean, it is a very important concept, uh, the flywheel and the expansion up upon that. So turning the flywheel, people can find that everywhere books are sold. Uh, they can certainly find you at jimcollins.com. Uh, many more questions I'd love to ask sometime, but uh, I, I think this is a very solid session for me to reflect on. I have tons of notes sitting here in front of me. I've been trying to take my notes quietly. Uh, but is there anything else you'd like to say, ask of people, suggest any, any parting words uh, before we wrap up this conversation for now? If I were to kind of step way back on everything, um, there's a line that Joanne uses a lot which is life as people. And we've talked about who luck and great mentors and personal boards of directors and getting married after four days and great friendships and being on really great level five teams and whatever. But, you know, we get so wrapped up in all these things we're doing or things we're trying to get done, but life is really short. I mean, you know that you named your company after on the guy who wrote a shortness of life. <laughs> and, and, you know, when you sort of add it all up, the one thing I, with everything we've talked about in this, I still think it all goes back to the first who. Life is people. And life at its best is about doing meaningful things with people you love. Here, here. Time with loved ones, high simplicity, time and flow state, but yep. ultimately it's the people. And uh, Jim, is there anywhere online besides jimcollins.com where uh, people might learn more about what you're up to or say hello? Are you on this amazing yet 
sometimes dreadful technology, uh, sometimes referred to as social media? I'm firing bullets. <laughs> uh, I'm going to be, I've fired a few bullets. I'm going to fire some uh, at this point. I haven't done a lot with it. Uh, so I'm kind of in the calibration stage. And the question I go back to on that with the social media is I've been struggling. Remember I said earlier, you know, don't make a thousand decisions. Well, what are one will do. What I have been struggling with is how, if I were to use that tool, do I make it great teaching moments? And for me, if I can kind of bullet the cannonball to that, then I'll probably do more with it. And if I can't, well, I've been fine without doing a lot. Mm -hmm. And where are you currently firing, firing bullets? And then I have, I have some thoughts, but is it on, on Twitter? Is it elsewhere? Uh, there's, we have a Twitter account, which I uh, I think it's called Level 5 Leaders. Um, it is, at Level 5 Leaders. Yeah, at Level mm -hmm. 5 Leaders. Uh, we have um, uh, a Jim Collins uh, Facebook page where uh, Amy on my team helps me think about some postings. But we haven't put up a lot, uh, so I wouldn't ha encourage that there's necessarily a ton there at the moment. We'll be firing bullets. Stay tuned. But our website, jimcollins.com, Everything there is designed to share and teach the ideas, and it's all really built around the ideas. When you go there, you know, it's, it's, it's an ideas-driven website, and we've taken a lot of care to try to make it a place where students of the work can come and have a, almost like cyber, cyber office hours, if you will, and, and really learn, and that's what it's designed to do. So I will say just a, a few things related to social media. Yeah. Uh, the, so the first is I've seen some incredible thinkers who've done a lot of deep work go down in flames <laughs> after <laughs> tapping the vein with social media. So I would say caution is warranted. That would be my, my first observation. Uh, the, because you have a history of, of saying no so well, and you yep. have so many policies that have served you in providing the space for the joyful solitude of deep work. Uh, so I would just say be very careful. And I was going to say when you were talking about burning your bridges that someone had said to me, you know, there, there, are three, there are three addictions that are the most dangerous addictions of all, heroin, alcohol, and a monthly salary. Mm. But I would, I would add to that social media. Uh, mm. there, there are, however, some examples, and I'll just give you one, mm -hmm. of people who I think do an exceptional job of teaching uh, using short form. And uh, there's one person on Twitter, there are many, uh, but I'll point to one who's a close friend of mine. His name is Naval Ravikant, and his handle is at Naval, N-A-V-A-L, like Naval Academy, but at Naval. So he, would, he might be someone to check out. But uh, so people can follow you at, at Level 5 Leaders. We will link to, for people listening, all of these various sites, all of the work, uh, including, of course, Turning the flywheel in the show notes, as always, at tim.blog forward slash podcast. You can just search uh, Jim Collins and this episode, and all of its notes will pop right up. Jim, this has been such a pleasure and uh, has given me so much to think about. And I'm so, so grateful for having spent the last two hours with you. Well, I, uh, I'm actually very grateful as well. And, and I, you're right, I don't actually say yes to very much at all. I've only fired bullets in this genre, and uh, and and this was one that's like I'm going to commit to really preparing and having a, a good conversation with you. And part of it is because what I really learned uh, about you is the care and depth of your preparation, and the fact that then you come into it with the idea of really wanting to have a conversation where you are present and engage with ideas and with thoughts, and and uh, and so. You know that notion of of prepared curiosity, uh, I think, is a great strength, and to be able to join you in that for me is uh, a real pleasure. And we're going to count at least half of this as creative hours. Definitely, <laughs> absolutely. And this uh, the podcast is certainly. I have to figure out which which piece of the puzzle, or I should say rather, which component of the flywheel it is, but is, it is certainly somewhere <laughs> because I feel drawn inevitably to have 
or to strive for this type of conversation. And it just gives me so much joy uh, to be able to spend time with someone like you and share it with, with everyone listening. So thank you again for that. And to everyone listening, you can find links, notes for everything at tim.blog forward slash podcast for all of the goodies that we discussed in this episode. And until next time, thank you for tuning in. Hey guys, this is Tim again. Just a few more things before you take off. Number one, this is Five Bullet Friday. Do you want to get a short email from me? And would you enjoy getting a short email from me every Friday that provides a little morsel of fun before the weekend? And Five Bullet Friday is a very short email where I share the coolest things I've found or that I've been pondering over the week. That could include favorite new albums that I've discovered. It could include gizmos and gadgets and all sorts of weird shit that I've somehow dug up in the uh, the world of the esoteric as I do. It could include favorite articles that I've read and that I've shared with my close friends, for instance. And it's very short. It's just a little tiny bite of goodness before you head off for the weekend. So if you want to receive that, check it out. Just go to fourhourworkweek.com. That's fourhourworkweek.com all spelled out and just drop in your email and you will get the very next one. And if you sign up, I hope you enjoy it. This episode is brought to you by Peloton, which I've been using probably for about a year now. Peloton is a cutting edge indoor cycling bike that brings live studio classes right into your home. You can also do on demand, which is what I do. We'll come back to that. So you don't have to worry about fitting classes into a busy schedule or making it to a studio or gym with a hectic or unpredictable commute. I, for instance, have a Peloton bike right in my master bedroom at home, and it's one of the first things I do many mornings. I wake up, I meditate for a bit, then I knock out a short 20 minute ride in my undies, hard to do that at the gym, take a shower, and I'm in higher gear for the rest of the day. It's really convenient and has become something that I look forward to. So you have a lot of options. For one, if you like, you can ride live with thousands of other riders across the country on an interactive leaderboard to keep you motivated. There are also up to 14 new classes added every day with more than 8,000 classes on demand. And you can pick based on length, 45 minutes, 20 minutes, whatever, music, hip hop, rock and roll, or say low impact versus high intensity or interval. You can pick the class structure and style that works for you. And in my case, I quite like Matt Wilpers, and I tend to do on-demand and listen to a lot of and watch many of the same classes over and over, but I'm kind of promiscuous and also enjoy classes from a lot of the other instructors. They have Peloton, an amazing roster of incredible instructors in New York City with a whole range of styles and personalities, so you can find what you're in the mood for. You also get real-time metrics that you can use to track your performance over time, and that will help I would say catalyze you to beat your personal best. Now that all sounds good, right? Gamification, yada, yada, yada. I didn't think that it would work for me or in any way incentivize me, but they really 100% hit the nail on the head. I was very, very impressed with how motivating it was. And it worked tremendously to keep me pushing. Uh, which quite honestly takes a fair amount. I can get quite lazy, particularly with anything that edges on endurance, which is kind of more than five reps of anything for me. So check it out. Discover this cutting edge indoor cycling bike that brings the studio experience right to your home. Peloton is offering listeners to this podcast a limited time offer. Go to onepeloton.com. That's O-N-E Peloton, P-E-L-O-T-O-N.com and enter the code TIM, all caps, at checkout and get $100 off of accessories with your Peloton bike purchase. So get a great workout at home anytime you want. Check it out. Go to OnePeloton.com and use the code TIM to get started. This episode of The Tim Ferriss Show is brought to you by LinkedIn. The right hire can make a huge impact on your business. The wrong hire can crater your business. And I have seen example after example from thousands of my readers at a minimum where they've told me stories of how finding the right person at the right time, and in some cases not even asking what should I do, but asking who should I find because that person can help me determine what exactly to do more intelligently. And I've had a chance to hire two such people in the last year and that has just made my business take a quantum leap forward and my complexity in my personal and business life get cut dramatically. And this type of simplification cannot be overvalued. We think a lot about hiring and I think a lot about hiring and it is a skill that I've had to learn. It is important to find the right person. But where do you find that person? 
you can post a job on a job board and hope that that right person finds your job, that they are on the internet happening to scan something here and there and then find you. But think about it. How often do you hang out on job boards? The answer is probably not very often. So don't leave finding someone great to chance when you can post your job exactly where people go every day to make connections, grow in their careers, and discover job opportunities. That is LinkedIn. Most LinkedIn members haven't recently visited the top job boards, but 9 out of 10 members are open to new opportunities. And with 70% of the U.S. workforce on LinkedIn, posting there is the best way to get your job opportunity in front of more of the right people. And you can be very, very highly targeted and specific. People who are qualified for the role you have and ready for something new. This is where you find them. It's the best way to find that person, that key person who will help you grow your business. And this is why a new hire is made every 10 seconds using LinkedIn. That's bonkers. Every 10 seconds. So head to linkedin.com forward slash Tim and get $50 off your first job post. That's linkedin.com forward slash Tim, T-I-M to get $50 off your first job post. LinkedIn.com forward slash Tim. Take a look. Terms and conditions do apply.